So welcome to the design review committee meeting of April 19th. Uh, I'll call the meeting to order and ask the commissioners to please respond when I call your name. Susan Besser. Here. Brian Laster. Here. Nick Mann, you said was absent. Uh, Lisa Marquardt. Here. Mayor Pierce. Here. Keith Scalf. Here. Kathy Worthington. Here. And Jim Roberts, here. Now I'd like to entertain a motion to approve resolution 2021-76, a resolution declaring that design review committee shall meet on April 19th, 2021 and conduct its essential business by electronic means rather than being required to gather a quorum of the members physically present in the same location because it is necessary to protect the health, safety and welfare of Tennesseans in light of the COVID-19 outbreak. Is there such a motion? Mr. Chair, this is Ken, I so move. Thanks Ken, is there a second? This is Lisa, second. Thank you, Lisa. All right, uh, then please respond. Commissioners want to call your name. Susan Besser. Aye. Brian Laster. Aye. Lisa Marquardt. Aye. Mary Pierce. Aye. Ken Scalf. Aye. Kathy Worthington. Kathy Worthington. All right, Jim Roberts, aye. During the COVID-19 <laughs> outbreak, she's, she's there, I know, she said I. Yeah. Uh, due to the COVID-19 outbreak, the meeting will be a virtual meeting. The purpose of the meeting will be to conduct a design review workshop. No decisions on applications will be made at the meeting. The public may call in to the conference meeting to listen at 312-626-6799, meeting ID 936-1012-2602. Passcode 532717. The public may email comments to planningintake at franklintn.gov to be provided in full to the commission and included in the minutes, but not read aloud in their entirety during the meeting. Email comments will be accepted until four o'clock on the day of the meeting. The meeting video will be available for public viewing 24 hours following the meeting to the City of Franklin YouTube account. All right, the DRC is a subcommittee of the Historic Zoning Commission. The meeting is informal and designed to guide applicants through the process of obtaining a Certificate of Appropriateness or COA for projects within the city's historic districts in light of the historic district design guidelines. Applicant participation in DRC is voluntary but highly recommended for complex renovations, additions, or new construction. Changes made or suggestions taken by the applicant based on discussions of the DRC are the applicant's choice, but DRC makes no representation as to whether any changes or suggestions made during the meeting will be approved by the voting body, which is the Historic Zoning Commission. There are six items on this afternoon's agenda. When your item is called, please introduce yourself and generally describe your item in about three to five minutes. Screen sharing permissions will be limited to staff, so ask staff to pull up pages of your item as needed. Please focus on the specific points of your project that you want us to, the DRC, to discuss. Once you've provided a general review, staff will provide comment on specific points for DRC to discuss as well. I will then ask for a roll call comments from the commission from the committee and any final comments from staff and the committee members afterwards. All right, we're for this is the first item discussion of the development plan recommendation request for potential development at the southeast and southwest corners of the intersection of Mac Hadger Parkway and Franklin Road. Kaiser Volkman Design is the applicant. Uh, Gary Volkman. Amanda, do you want to comment first? Yes, if you don't mind, I'd love to yeah. just give an introduction and then maybe share some of staff's comments uh, following the, uh, the applicant presentation. So uh, this is a development plan recommendation request. You know, that's something that is not as familiar to members of the DRC, but with the December 2019 zoning ordinance update, um, staff established a mechanism that requires that any new development plan within the historic preservation overlay uh, seek um, a formal recommendation request from the Historic Zoning Commission. The reason for that is that the um, recommendation would be forwarded to the 
Planning Commission and also the Board of Mayor and Aldermen um, when reviewing the proposal for their respective um, roles within the review process. Um, the information that the Historic Zoning Commission relays through that formal recommendation is based on how a proposed development relates contextually to the district and in, in the um, surrounding area in which it's situated. The Historic Zoning Commission should consider items such as lot size, uh, lot configuration, um, general architectural form, and I should say as a caveat, knowing that all the individual buildings will be required to be approved by the Historic Zoning Commission at a later date, and building setbacks, so where the buildings will sit in respect to each other and onto the, the lots on which they're situated. A development is proposed for this on the southeast and southwest corners of Mac Hatcher where it meets Franklin Road. So anything south of Mac Hatcher on Franklin Road with frontage on Franklin Road is in the historic preservation overlay. Uh, this is inclusive of the National Register listed Creekside property, which is on the southeast side of that intersection. And so please keep in mind that that will include review by staff of the proposal in light of chapter 18 of the zoning ordinance, which is related to historic resources and protection of historic resources. Um, the staff will, um, you know, has recommended to the applicant previously in conversation that the applicant consider integrating the development or the house um, into the proposed development so that the house is um, related to the development in architectural form, in architectural details, um, and is not separated from it or adjacent to buildings that are not congruent to it. So the applicant will go ahead. Uh, I think we've got Gary here from Kaiser Brogren, as well as some potential owner representatives. I believe we have Christian Dial here um, who would like to share the proposal with you. And I'll go ahead and pull that up, Gary. Yeah, thanks, Amanda. Thank you, Amanda. Oh, you're welcome. Well, she's pulling Amanda, that up. Amanda, before we Gary. get started. Oh, good. Go ahead. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Um, no, you're fine. Can you just uh, read that list again about uh, what you were just saying about how we determine whether it relates contextually, please? Sure. So we're going to look at lot size, mm -hmm. lot configuration. And when I say configuration, I mean specifically you know, the, the, the width and depth of the lot in relation to those around it in the historic district, um, okay. general architectural features. Um, this will just be very general. Um, big picture view of that because we will be reviewing those individually later. Um, and then I would also recommend that you look at building setbacks. So where the buildings sit in relation to each other and where they sit in relation to the law in which they're situated. Okay, thank you. You're very welcome. Okay, I'll turn it over to Gary. Thank you, Amanda. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Gary Bogren with Kaiser Bogren Design. I'm a landscape architect, land planner here in Franklin, Tennessee. Um, thank you for your time. You can see everybody, a lot of familiar faces up on the screen. Can't wait to see everybody in person soon. Um, so as Amanda mentioned, this is a PD development submittal, rezoning. So we're kind of in the initial kind of process of going through the elements of design and planning, working with the city of Franklin. So this will have to go before the planning commission, your board, board of mayor of Alderman. So we're just trying to get as much feedback as we can from this group, knowing that it's in the HPO. A lot to do with architecture. We're most, more focused right now on the plan. We're gonna come back to you with some more elevations and character of the buildings. Again, we're initial in the process of the, the master planning, but I wanna get your feedback. Um, and I have Christian Dial from uh, is, uh, is our client on the phone as well. He can chime in as well with any comments or questions as we go through the process. So thank you. Um, Amanda, could you go to the next slide, please? Sure. So I'll just briefly go through this. I think everybody knows what the property is, about 61 acres total, two tracks, um, south and southeast and southwest of Mac Hatcher. Um, a lot of floodplain, floodway, um, open field, basically. Um, thank you, so Amanda. Next creek slide. sites here, and then yep. Rivers Knobs over here. Thank you. Uh, so these are just character images of the site when we walked out there. Uh, everybody knows a lot of these, the historic home site, the open fields, the floodplain, um, the 
Spencer Creek, uh, elements of the Creekside Estate. Uh, I'll go back to these images if we need to, but these are just for more for your reference. And I think a lot of people have been to by the site, driven past the site many times. The site, um, the home Creekside is currently rented at this time. It's been rented probably for 10 years and needs a little TLC. So this plan incorporates this, this homestead and some of its ancillary buildings and preservation of and uh, bringing it back to its more uh, character that we all love to see. Next slide, Amanda. More images, we can get back to these if we need to specifically look at some of these, but just character images of the site. Um, so this one, so this kind of defines the general area of the plan. We've got uh, basically the two orange areas are where we're talking about development of the property, which entitles about six acres of development on the left, on the western side or left side near the church and about to 14 acres of orange on the right side or the eastern side on the creek side or state side. The setbacks off of Franklin Road, Mac Hatcher are 150 feet. So we cannot build any structure within 150 feet of Mac Hatcher and or Franklin Road. And that is that tan zone that she's kind of highlighting there. Those are non-build zones. We can put landscape walls, fencing, ornamentation, uh, but no buildings or streets are allowed in that zone. And that's kind of the character we want to maintain and preserve along Franklin Road as everybody is very familiar with as you come into Franklin driving south in the town. Um, as Amanda had mentioned, we've got Roper's Knob to the bottom right, um, the uh, uh, Brad Kelly site south of us, Harlandsdale Manor to the west side, and then the Franklin Methodist Church directly west. Um, in the green zone is pri primarily floodplain, floodway, natural open space that we just want to be hands off, don't touch that. Um, it also includes the Creekside Estate Manor as well. So a little context about the site. Thank and you, Gary, Matt. just but, to jump in yeah, really quickly, you said this yeah. is all floodplain, so there's no um, hill area in this green space, correct? There's no what? Like hill, like hillside space. Oh no, that's all low-lying um, topography. That's all Spencer Creek, floodplain, the railroad tracks. Uh, I forgot to mention that, that kind of flies through the site on the eastern tract. Yeah, that's there, all floodplain and floodway, Amanda, yes. Yeah, the reason I ask is just so that they're clear that this is not um, the base of Rivers Knob. This is forward of that. Correct. Okay. So this is the plan and the primary objectives of this plan are one is to have a front facing forward project that really addresses Franklin Road. Um, the second is the preservation of the Creekside Estate and bringing harmony of architecture as it relates to that building, as well as other characteristics of architecture within the city of Franklin. And the third is preservation of open space, which were about 70% open space. So on this plan, when I say front facing, we're showing two product types. The front facing product type is a single family estate lot, which are the yellow boxes, basically the front Franklin Road on both sides. Those are single family lots. The second product backward behind those two units of product are the big house estates, the orange buildings, and there's a, a cluster of each of those on each, each side of the property. So there's basically two types of product on this project single family lots and then the big house estates, um, creating that 150 foot setback off of Franklin Road. So all those units that front Franklin Road are forward facing on Franklin Road, alley loaded, ranging from 65 feet wide down to 40 feet wide. Um, basically a minimum buildable area is about 4,000 square feet, but the lots all extend to Franklin Road with alley load access to the back. And I'll show you a typical diagram uh, later on in the presentation. Um, the big house units behind that, the estates are four units each, two and a half stories, four units total in each building. They have two units on the ground floor, two units above. Um, as you can see on this plan, we're preserving a lot of green, a lot of trees, open space, floodplain. Creekside Estate is the, the um, area labeled A. That is the current homestead there. Um, C is where the driveway currently exists as you come into the, the state. B is the spring house, just south of that. Letter B is the spring house. 
Um, so we want to kind of maintain and preserve the character of this homestead within this cluster of existing trees and then develop around that and integrate it in architecturally into the master plan. So really kind of focusing on preserving open space around the state, maintaining its character, and then developing around that area within the open field, open field basically, and minimizing tree disturbance and really just building in that open field as you see today. Um, you can see Spencer Creek kind of flies through the southern piece of the property, that blue line, that's all floodway, floodplain. Um, we're showing an access point using the existing driveway coming into Creekside Estate and then aligning itself on the western side. This is preliminary and conceptual. We're still working with staff and engineering on this. So as we submit this for the PD, that's going to be more of a bigger discussion about access in addition to the plan elements that you see here today. Gary, just to clarify, the proposal for the mm -hmm. driveway, as you mentioned, is very conceptual, but it doesn't align exactly to where the driveway is right now, correct? Yeah, right now we're showing the drive about, it's just right on the southern edge of the current driveway. So it's, it's real close to it, just a little bit south of it. We really wanted to come in and balance between the estate, which is A, and the spring house, which is B, to kind of bisect between there and to preserve those two historical structures and then get access to the Eastern track. Yes, that's right. So to align with McMahon over here, ideally. McMahon is currently to the South. We're suggesting to the city that we align and move oh, I see. Daniel McMahon to the North to get those two streets and intersections out of the floodplain is the intent. So that's our initial proposal to talk with them about that. I've, We've had conversations with the engineering department in the city about this, but that's something we'll just have to kind of work through that process. Okay, thank you. So this is the typical lot diagram for these single family lots that face Franklin Road. As I mentioned, these lots all face forward to Franklin Road. They vary in depth from about 258 feet to 270 feet long but knowing you have a 150 foot setback in front of you. So <laughs> these lots are really long and narrow and you have a buildable area within the yellow block you see in this, this drawing that shows basically the 150 foot setback along Franklin Road, five foot, set, five foot side setbacks, a five foot rear setback that we could either push the garage right on the alley about five feet off or push it back 22 feet to have a parking aid from behind it with tandem parking, um, but really, allow a variety of different lot sizes fronting Franklin Road alley loaded product. Next slide, Amanda. This is the typical building uh, estate lot diagram, big house estate lot diagram, showing the big house estate fronting a public road, which is internal to the development, not facing Franklin Road, that are you know typically, these buildings range from 60 to 65 feet uh, wide, deep to 80 feet wide, two units ground floor, two units above, front porch, uh, garage in the back with tandem parking off an alley product, um, but to allow a 10 foot front setback and a 25 to 20 foot rear setback. But in the end, all, all this architectural has to go before this board, Historic Zoning Commission, um, the Franklin Planning Commission, Board Mayor of Alderman. So that's kind of our next step to work on the architectural elevations, the character, because as we know, this all needs to tie to what Amanda said in terms of the Creekside Estate, existing character of Franklin architecture styles and mimic that. Um, the design intent is really, you know, to create this rural farmstead look, architectural style, preservation of open space and organizing elements to tie the buildings to the street and to the open space. Uh, I'm not sure, Christian, if you had anything to add to that, if you wanna um, make any contribution, if that, we can answer any questions you might have. No, I don't, I don't have anything to add other than just, you know, we contextually want to uh, provide as much of a rural feel and uh, living experience to the site as we can obviously knowing that it's you know, being developed into uh, a subdivision, but um, aesthetically, we really want it to represent the character of rural Franklin and uh, um, 
as a transition into some of the more downtown areas of Franklin as well. Thank you, Christian. So yeah, we'd be glad to offer any questions or uh, anything we can uh, address at this time. Okay, Amanda, you wanna make any more comments? Yes, please, thank you. And thank you very much, Gary and, and Christian for, for, this, for that presentation. I'm gonna skip ahead to this plan because I think it's the best at showing conceptually yeah. what's going on. How about enlarging um, that, Amanda, if you would? I can. Click it up a little <coughs> bit for old Just, eyes. Okay. Yeah. I totally get it. Okay. <laughs> So um, I'm going to kind of hover through here and then I'm going to actually end up toggling to a different screen too so you can see some of the things I want to point out. So this area is, um, or this, this historic district, the Franklin Road Historic District is largely the frontage of the Franklin Road uh, or Franklin Road between downtown and Matt Catcher. So I'm going to um, actually switch screen over to a map, an aerial map that just kind of gives a better overview of that. If you'll bear with me just a second. Please let me know if you see the actual aerial map. This is City of Franklin Interactive Zoning Map. Yes? Yes, yes. Um, okay, great. <laughs> I, need, I need that confirmation. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> okay, so we're on Franklin Road here. You can see this is Harlan Still Farm, the main barn. The, the um, historic district runs the gamut from downtown here, when you cross the river, you have um, some infill, you have um, lower campus BGA, which is on the National Register, Riverview, which is on the National Register, very large lots. Then we do have an infill um, 70 subdivision here. We have a little bit of infill and in mixed historic here that's not in the historic district. Moving further, you have um, some some ranches, some historic buildings all through here, and then you have um, Hooper Lane. The most conservative lot size that we have fronting Franklin Road is likely these houses that are, I'm sorry, this isn't Hooper Lane, this is, um, this is Miles Manor. And then some of the most conservative um, lot sizes we have on Franklin Road are here at, at Hooper Lane. So what fronts Hooper Lane or fronts Franklin Road off of Hooper Lane are these three buildings here and then all these front Hooper Lane. These lot sizes, this, the most conservative is about 65 feet in width, just from a very general um, measurement here. So as, um, as Gary had mentioned, the lot sizes proposed in these yellow areas are single family homes between 40 feet wide and 65 feet wide. And I wanted to give you a sense of what 65 feet looks like. It's from about here to here. And that's very rough measurement, but that's an idea here. And that's probably the most conservative size we have fronting on the Franklin Road. The next most conservative size that I can show you in this area. Ma'am, by conservative, do you mean smallest? Smallest, smallest in width, yeah. yes. So the small, next smallest in width that we have is probably this infill building at the very front of Harlan Stell Manor. This lot size, and I can measure it right here. Let's just see. And again, this is very crude because I have to draw a straight line. That's about 120 feet wide, 125 feet wide. So I just wanted to give you a sense of what that means in relation to what we're talking about over here. So, you know, this is very conceptual at the time, but staff would recommend that the lot configuration be adjusted so that it is definitely larger than what you're seeing for these single families here, because contextually 40 feet to 65 feet is just not the, it's not even the average of what you see on this frontage on Franklin Road. 60, we have three that are this, that very small that are maybe around 65 feet. So I think if, if, we are to move forward, we should consider 65 feet as the very smallest width that should be considered for these single family homes. Um, that will also uh, allow for more space around uh, between each building, which is more indicative of the rural view shed that you see up and down Franklin Road. As far as the um, Creekside development, let me grab this hand here. Um, I do 
think that this approach is a little bit more of a naturalistic screen because it doesn't feel as integrated with the development, which is fine. I think that I'd like to see more about what these buildings would look like in relation architecturally to this building. Just a general overview. I know that elevations are too much to ask at this point, um, but I'd like to know that with this being a two-story form um, and uh, more of a higher end vernacular, that makes no sense, a, a higher end farmhouse that these might relate a little bit more um, vocabulary um, as far as architecture goes to, to Creekside. Um, that's just something that Excuse we- Excuse me, Amanda, are right we now. supposed to be looking at the site plan while you do no, this? No, she, no, no, not at this stage. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry, yes, yes. I am actually pointing at this, the site plan. I forgot to, to switch the share. Thank you, thank you, thank but you. But wait a minute, wait a minute. Before we go to, to that, does this proposed development extend into the wooded area that's uh, on the on the east side that is showing right off of Mac Hatcher, uh, that area right there? Yes, it does. It it does. So you're yes, still 150 does. feet off. You're 150 feet off to where this property will start. Gary, do you want to speak to that, please? So we have a 150 foot building setback off of Mac Hatcher and Franklin Road. So a portion of that is in the trees. Yes. Is that what you're asking? Yes. yes. That's, what, that's what I'm asking. Amanda, can you put the dimension on that? Can you put your, how much footage you've got of that, that whole wooded area? So I get that in my head. Now, Gary, can, can you, is it off the, the, the road line. lane or the? Be right at the property line, 150 from the property line. From the property line. Oh, let me go a different way. So around here. Okay. All right. That, that's okay. I, I got it. That's that's okay. good. All right. Now go ahead to Lisa's comments. Okay. I'm going to switch the share. Switch to the, yeah. Sorry about that. That's what happens when you have two screens. And okay, you, can, so you, can, you can shrink that a little bit, Amanda. Okay. It doesn't have to be 66. That, that's good. 50, I think, is fine. Okay. So what my suggestion was is that these are, are shown as being somewhere between 40 and 65 feet wide. Um, my recommendation would be that they would be ideally about twice as wide as the 40, um, but 65, which should be the very minimum that's considered by historic zoning because it's the um, nothing along the roadway is um, this configuration or this width for, for a lot. As far as Creekside goes, um, this building is a higher style farmhouse and I would like more information from the applicant as, um, as part of the formal recommendation request as to how the intent of these buildings architecturally will relate to this house to see how it meets chapter 18 in terms of architectural style and, and integrating the, um, the house into the development overall. Thank you. Um, Amanda? I don't know if this is appropriate time for me to speak up. This is Amy Diaz Briga, the current planning supervisor. Um, Amanda, could you clarify, do you have any um, recommendations on the setbacks that they're proposing? I believe they're only proposing a five foot five yard side yard setback. Um, yes, I. That's, that's a great question, Amy. I think that in, in my um, intention was, and I, I should have probably been more clear about this, is if these lots are wider, that it will create more space between the buildings than the five feet on either side, because that would be a, a more contextually sensitive to what you see up and down Franklin Road in this section of town. Okay, so if I'm hearing you correctly, you would also support, you would recommend larger side yard setbacks, perhaps like 10 feet uh, instead of five feet? Uh, at a minimum, yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Is that all you got, Amanda? It is. Amy, did you have anything else to add? Uh, no, that was my only clarification. I wanted to make sure you brought up. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I'm going to let the commissioners ask questions. And Lisa, since you started it, you'd be the first one on this. All right. <coughs> Excuse me. So um, I think our commissioners would agree that uh, context to historic zoning is uh, you can't separate the two. 
And I'm having a hard time seeing these single family units as um, fitting into the context of what else we have there, uh, not to mention the historic Creekside property. Um, the big houses, uh, even those seem, I mean, those seem a little bit more contextually appropriate, but even with the big houses, as you call them, um, it, it's not, uh, it seems inconsistent and contextually out of harmony with um, what Amanda was showing us as the context that we have to work from. Uh, we are speaking of 18 single family units, is that right? Or more, or how many? There's 14 there's... shown on this side and then there's 19 shown on this side. Oh, That's right. okay. All right, so 19 and then 14 and then- uh, And Lisa, I'll just add really quickly and I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, the, the quote unquote big house concept is something that is supported by Envision Franklin for this area. So it will be something that the, um, the planner support in theory. Now, um, I'd love to hear more about what your thoughts are on spacing and, and scale for those buildings. Well, let's, also... let's, define, let's define big house. Yeah, let, let's do uh, that. And then uh, also, uh, if we could get a little bit more, uh, and, and I was taking notes, but uh, I might have lost my way on the, on the lot sizes for the big, quote, big houses. Thank Amy, you. do you mind speaking a little bit to the big house concept, please? I don't mind if she's not on. Oh, okay. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, the big house is a is a building type in Envision Franklin that reflects three to four dwelling units in a single structure that looks like a house, but it really has three to four dwelling units within it. And Big houses are a secondary um, use in Envision Franklin, secondary to single family residential. So are, are there any examples that we can point them to that you can think of right now that would be a, a big house concept? There's a few on Park Run and McKay's Mill. We have some approved. We don't have many constructed today. Right. Don't compare them, don't compare them to Mac Hatcher <laughs> or the uh, McKay's Mill. <laughs> but the idea is that they are to look like large single family homes. Can I share my screen for real quick? I had just impressive images that we've used with aldermen we've met with, if that's all right, Amanda. Sure, I just changed the setting. You should be able to go ahead and do that. Uh, let's see. And I, I'd like the, all the other applicants on the line, thank you so much for your patience. This, this is just a little bit more, um, it requires a little bit more conversation than a typical application. Uh, I'm trying to find it, give me one second, I'm sorry. But to speak to the big house a little bit, that concept is supported as a secondary use on these properties by Envision Franklin based on the, uh, the location. Um, so we, we would want to focus the discussion today on um, the scale and architecture of those generally, as well as their relationship to each other um, on lots, like what the can lot configuration and size is. Yes, sir. Yes, yes. Okay, so these, you know, not all these are big houses. Some of these are, some of these are not. But this is the character we're trying to establish for a big house. And as Kelly and Amanda had mentioned, this is permittable with any conservation design on this property in addition to single family. So these are uh, single family units, uh, style characteristics, four units in each building, two ground floor, two above, to really mimic the estate house style. So this is something we're trying to incorporate. And these are just images we found in and about. Some of these are in Franklin, some of these are not. Um, but really to allow for four units within each building. But if you're driving by them, you would not know that. Each would have their own door, private access, not a common hallway. You'd have a 
private access to your unit, but look like a large estate house. These are behind the single family lots in the orange buildings as we saw, but these are just kind of characteristics and there's many, and there's a couple in Vision Franklin that Kelly showed in that document, a few estate uh, big houses in there as well. Um, but that's kind of our next stage to really start to, to refine these and the characteristics related to them. So Gary, are these, can, can we say these are for rent or are they for sale? Each unit within the big house? They would be for rent and be set up to be for sale in the future as so desired. Okay. All right. That, that, like a that's condominium right. regime. Yes, 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 yes. Okay, thank you. And uh, that's very helpful, by the way. Uh, the total number of big houses is what? There are 32 big houses. 25 on the east and seven on the west. 32 total, yes. Gary, I'm gonna go ahead and pull the conceptual site plan back up for their reference. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, and, and Lisa, to your question, um, the uh, setbacks between buildings proposed for the big houses would be 10 with a 10 yard, um, 10 for front yard and, and 20 for rear. And that would, just to clarify, it looks like that would be a total of 10 feet between buildings, which would be like a five foot setback on each lot if there was one. Big yeah. houses can be, can be, have multiple buildings on one lot, but it's suggesting 10 feet between buildings, which is again, what we talked about on Franklin Road with five feet each side, if there was a lot. Yes. Yeah, we'd like to do 20 feet between buildings. Yeah, 10 foot side yards being, meaning 20 feet apart, yes. Oh, okay, thank you. Hey, Gary, while we're on this, what, what exactly is tandem parking? That is a stacked car behind the garage. So if your garage is 20 feet off the alley, you can park behind your garage. Does that make sense, Ken? Yes, thank you. All right, Lisa, did you have anything else? And let, us, let me go down the roll if, it, if you don't have anything else at this point. Uh, no, that, that was very helpful, thank okay. you. Okay, Susan Besser. Uh, well, I have to take say this kind of takes my breath away. Uh, when I look at the density of this. So um, I think the thing I'm trying to understand is uh, it is across the street from Iron Horse. Is that correct? Yes. 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 And so and how does this fit? I'm going to ask this to Kelly. How does this fit in terms of the envision plan for Franklin? Because I'm trying to look at the big picture here. That's a great question. Um, Iron Horse came in under the old land use plan, which did not have a number of units associated with a big house. So the, essentially Iron Horse came in as a big house development, but there are perhaps 12 to 16 units per building in, in many of those buildings. There are some smaller units as well. Um, but we updated Envision Franklin to provide more specificity in the guidance on what a big house is. And so that's where the up to four units comes into play so that the scale can resemble more of a single family scale. Does that help? Uh, it does help some. And then I guess, Amanda, you talked about the single houses that the lot sizes don't really fall in line with what our recommendations would be. Is that correct? Well, it, it would not fall in line with staff's recommendation for the context of Franklin Road. Um, okay. The overall vision of this plan may meet in Vision Franklin, but it doesn't necessarily um, meet the contextual recommendations by staff for this, um, this corridor. Okay. All right. So those are my comments. I'm just, uh, it's, it's a pretty big thing to take into Take a take, get your head wrapped around. The other thing is, um, and I'm not asking this to the applicant. What was your? Um, is there a, a development that you patterned this after? I'm just curious to see, you know, because it's so unique. I don't know that there's anything like that in Franklin, and I'm just wondering what you patterned it after. Well, hopefully that's yeah. a good question. <laughs> hopefully that's a. That's a uh... 
a compliment if you like the design. But uh, yeah, this is something we just came up with that really tried to reinforce the Franklin frontage and the character you see coming into town. Please remember, this is at the corner of Matt Catcher and Franklin Road. There's a lot of traffic on the street. And the question has become some of what about lot size. And I, I understand that, but just remember where you are on this corridor coming into town. Uh, but it was really just trying to do something that, as I heard from aldermen and planning commissioners, was that how can we do something to really enhance the character and, re and provide single family lots fronting Franklin Road, push the density towards the back because we're adjacent railroad tracks, we're against the church and transition density from the front to the back, so to speak, away from Franklin Road. Um, you know, something like this, probably you can see in Berry Farms that we've master planned. Some of this is in Carlisle. Um, some of this is in West Haven. There's just various plans that we all kind of look at and design within Franklin. We've been here a long time and take a lot of pride in what we do in terms of land planning. So this is kind of just something we've come up with to really preserve that character, preserve open space, and come in with a plan that really respects Envision Franklin with Single family is the, the primary use and the allowability of big houses is the secondary use. But providing then, community gardens, common open space, a great streetscape, trails, uh, great frontage along Franklin Road. Something also to keep in mind from green, within, if you're driving down Franklin Road, that gap between trees, uh, between the words Franklin Road is about 500 feet. So you're seeing about 500 feet of the site as you're driving by, a little snippet, and then it's all trees, and then the Creekside Estate. So that, that open area is about 500 feet right there. It's a very quick view shed. You've got that little Mallory Valley water building. <laughs> it's just ugly sitting right there that we have to, it's, it is what it is. It's got to stay there. Right. So we really try to create that open space that fronts Franklin Road, then spills into the site, into the community, in the block D, label D. There's two open spaces that kind of tie to that. Does that hopefully help answer that question? Yes, it does. And do you perceive that these will have side, these will have sidewalks? Uh, the public streets in uh, Tan will have uh, sidewalks on both sides of the street. Yeah, that she's highlighting there. Alley Load, those don't have si sidewalks. Like uh, this one going, is alley loaded. Yeah, those are alleys behind all the big houses and behind right. the city from lots. And then the trails kind of parallel Franklin Road that would tie into the Greenway system that we that we did for the city of Franklin. All those trails would tie into Mac Hatcher, tie into the trail that goes along Daniel McMahon down in Harlesdale Farms, all that tied together. That you could walk from this development property from Creekside Estate all the way downtown in Harlesdale uh, Park. If this is this is Christian Dial to the, the applicant. Uh, just to tag on to what Gary said is, you know, as we studied the Envision Franklin document and the specifics that called out uh, this corridor here and this, these sites, is it, it really called for protecting as much of the rural character as we could. Um, also, you know, putting the economics into play as well. But we uh, wanted to we shrunk our lot sizes a little bit and width to help try to protect more of an open green space corridor into the site. Um, and, and that is partially the reason uh, that they're a little bit skinnier in size and lots. And, uh, and then those also are the uh, lot sizes defined in the Envision Franklin document as well. But um, it's also helpful to get some more historical context and lot widths um, around, around down Franklin Road. Um, to know how it fits, fits in contextually overall. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I do think some an organic, more organic approach may be helpful here, where you have a mix of different lot widths um, that don't feel as regular, especially on the um, the west side here, where there's a longer stretch. Maybe have um, wider lots mixed in with narrower lots. Okay, Susan Besser, do you have any other comments at this time? Uh, no, I don't, but that was that was very helpful. Thank you very much. Brian Laster. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Jim. Uh, one of my questions is to uh, Amanda and Kelly. Uh, do you know of any plans in the future to widen Franklin Road? So there is currently a um, an ongoing 
proposal or ongoing project down at the other end of Franklin Road toward Mac Hatcher um, for widening. I don't know if I'm aware of anything on this end of Franklin Road south of Mac Hatcher. Kelly, do you? Um, not with certainty. There is the shorter term project further down, as Amanda uh, mentioned, and this would ultimately be a future phase to likely only have two lanes with a middle turn lane up until Mac Hatcher. Yes. And the main reason for that question with the 150 foot setback, right. I was wondering if that would, you know, get left. Brian, you've frozen better. For them in the future. But you're, if it's coming from the. You're muted, Brian. Am, am I still, do you hear me now? Yeah, yes. yeah, but you were cutting in and out, plus muted, so that's. The, uh, um, yeah, I wonder, just on the setbacks, if they do widen the road, if the setback would become less than 150 feet. That's a good point. Uh, the next question that I have has to do with Creekside. What are what are the plans for Creekside and the, the spring house? Gary, do you want to speak to that, please? Yeah, I can try. Yeah, the intent is to preserve those both of those structures and bring them into the plan, update you know the building. It needs some little rehabilitation, little TLC, as I mentioned. I think Christian's thinking about bringing this building into the project as a community center, leasing center, office, uh, part of the amenity package, um, you know, as part of this development, but not to be a single-family residence. Is that is that what you're asking? That that was my question. Okay. Uh, the other has to do with the big house. Uh, what is the square footage of each unit? Christian, can you answer that? Yeah, um, <clears throat> it'd be a variety of different unit types um, across, and, and all the buildings would be, we'd have different um, types of buildings to, to characterize different you know, estates as well. Um, but anywhere from the smallest unit size, maybe 720 to 750 square feet and the biggest unit size all the way up to uh, 1600 square feet. Um, the, the, the idea behind the big house is to uh, be able to replicate a larger estate home. Um, and then from a, a condo or rental perspective, be able to provide something that's a little more uh, infill and has a little more uh, uh, of a, but it has a more single family feel in its living option uh, with, you know, an integrated attached garage with direct access into your unit and also your own entry point to the outside of the building and patios and balconies and, that are all private to that unit as well. So Christian, thank you for that. And just to, to clarify for Brian's question. So your anticipation is that a big house um, footprint square footage could be upward to maybe 7,500 square feet. I didn't hear that. I, I heard I heard 750 to 1,600. So yeah, and I times guess I was four, times, four, yeah. times four would be 3,000 to 6,400. So would that, that 3,000 to 6,400 footprint be, or not footprint, but um, total square footage be around the range? Yeah, I think, I think, uh, total, I'm just doing some quick math, but I'd say on average, you're probably looking at about 4,000 square feet to 5,000 square feet. If it's a little bit of a bigger uh, average square footage within that building. But, um, you know, really just trying to look at it as like a, a what looking like a large house. Yeah, right. Uh, but just to kind of give us all a little. Right. Yeah. So, so, yeah, perspective wise, it, I'd say. Yeah, you know, between four to five thousand square feet. Okay, total. All right, that would be our average. All right, That's and for right. Um, for something to relate to, uh, a lot of the homes, uh, the larger homes in Harlan still are between four and five thousand square feet for a footprint. Okay, all right, Brian, do you have anything else? Yeah, just just one more, because you know I'm not really familiar and haven't seen this big big house concept. Uh, and you, so my mind goes to a car apartment complexes where most of the buildings are pretty much all the same. Mm -hmm. Do you envision all of these being the same, or will they have a variety of architectural styles? Uh, I, I envision it being a variety of architectural styles, and we're working on different architectural style elevations just to present to you guys at the next uh, next hearing if, if we can. Uh, but I, I envision it as 
you know, I, I live in Cincinnati, Ohio, and there's a lot of old historical neighborhoods here as well uh, that remind me of, of Franklin a lot in character in some locations. And um, I envision it as kind of a uh, old, old uh, urbanist community where uh, you just have a variety of larger estate homes that you know were built in the early 1900s and they all resemble kind of that that uh, certain type of character where you know back in the day they may they may have split some of them up as two families or three families when they were uh, going through the depression era um, and so the idea is to create that character uh, but also make them live um, very, very good for, for a renter by a uh, lifestyle uh, type of renter or somebody that wants a low maintenance lifestyle but still wants the, the private privacy of uh, you know, having their own patio or entrance and garage. It is a, it's kind of a, a unique concept where I, I've been doing this for a while and, and worked on a bunch of different projects that, and uh, work, we're doing something pretty unique here. And it's, I thought it was really cool and exciting that you guys uh, had a mechanism for it in your zoning code and your in land use plan. And uh, it's something that we're excited to, to execute on and, and do something really different. Ron, anything else? Mr. Chair, that's it, thank you. All right, Mary Pierce. And, and let's kind of roll on through this. We've been at this about an hour and we've got about okay. five more applicants. So I wanna uh, try to- uh, I know that I've, I've worked with a whole lot of community people on the, the zoning this property to hopefully protect the character of it. What is the current zoning? It is a state residential, two what? acres per one dwelling unit, yes. one single family dwelling unit. Yes. So this density to me is stunning. Um, this is a rural landscape. It has been our most preserved corridor into town. We were sold. Uh, we, we, we never thought that this kind of density would come forward. I don't think it's appropriate. Um, I, I don't, um, I don't, I'm trying to get over my fear of big houses. We were sold iron horse as the big house concept. And I do understand that's been corrected, but there's just a little ouch with me on that. Um, I don't think, uh, I think we need to know how this works with uh, road widenings in the future. And I knew the ladies that lived in the house, they had terrible noise issues um, from a livability point of view. Um, it would seem to me like there would be more, um, a, a bit more buffering uh, needed. I think uh, Harlandsdale Manor has been a huge success. I was hoping uh, the character would be more from that, but um, th I think those are, I, and I think also I would just say that um, the the lines for the the homes going all the way to Franklin Road. Is, is that what it is, that that would house would own that 150 acres all the way to Franklin Road? Yes, Mary, this is Gary. Those would all be platted to Franklin Road because they need public road frontage, but that 150 foot setback would be maintained by the HOA and allow trails to go through there. So the owner would not have to main that 150 foot that would be maintained by the homeowner association. Okay, um, it might at least help Gary to see not all those lines there or something uh, because um, I, I just I, I just do not believe uh, this will preserve the character of Franklin Road and I know you all do a great product and I would like to see it come in with a lot less density. Thank you. All right, Thank you, thanks. Ken Scalf. Yes, yeah, not to belabor this big house concept, but I just I'm just trying to understand this completely. So would an individual <clears throat> of you know the demographics of an individual that would consider the iron horse, would they consider this or would this be upscale? The only the only thing 
context that I could put this in, it reminds me of houses adjacent to a college campus that's that's cut up to for student housing. Obviously, it's a much more sophisticated example of that, but that's the only context that I can compare it to. And the other thing I wanted to ask is the open area. Is that is there any access going to be provided to the the people that live here or to others to that open area? So I can speak to the big house a little bit. Um, yeah, I think I think uh, you're you're kind of on the point. It's a more sophisticated approach to uh, what you see maybe in in that setting next to a college campus. But it's also I would look at it as more of an alternative to a townhouse house product. And that what it what it op offers is uh, instead of an up and down type of living style within your unit where you're you know, having to go downstairs to your laundry level or garage and then go up to your main level where your, your kitchen usually is and you have a bedroom and then you have your bedrooms above that. Um, what this does offer is more of a, a flat style living when you're inside your unit. So um, what we've seen from uh, some of our portfolio and, and other, other uh, projects that we've been a part of is that uh, not everybody likes the townhome concept, uh, especially as you, as uh, we have a lot of empty nesters that that uh, live in our projects, and and as they get uh, older, they don't necessarily want to deal with the all the uh, flights of stairs to each part of their living area. So this is an opportunity to offer something that uh, once you're in your unit, you're it's it lives more like a a, a ranch style home almost. So you're you're not having to go up and down a bunch of levels. Mr. Chair, yeah, I'd, I'd also like to offer that um, it's really the number of single family lots that are allowing the number of big houses that are shown on this plan. So what I've heard so far is that there is there is support to increase the size, the width of those lots along Franklin Road which would then impact the number of big houses on the plan, unless that's redesigned because Envision Franklin calls for a single family as the primary use and big houses as a secondary use, but that can mean that there might be, you know, for example, 51% single family, 49% big house buildings. So that's where it all plays together in, in terms of how the design impacts the, the number of buildings. And Kelly, with that okay, said, thanks. on this east side, there's 14 single families shown, but there's um, 25, 25 big house. Big house. Is that, is, does that fall into line with what you stated? I think we'd look at it as all one development because it's all proposed as one. Oh, I see. Okay. And I think they might be just one over in single family, but if I'm mistaken, let me know, Gary, one more single family lot than big house. Is that about about right? Yes, that's, there, right. that's, that's right. That's what I see. 33, there are 33 single family and uh, 32 big house. Okay, thank you, Kelly. And thank you, Jim. Okay, Ken, did you have anything else? What about the open area? When we yeah, spoke about that. Good, good question. So, so open area question, uh, can open, the open space is all part of the community. So um, it's, it's open space to this property. I guess people could come in because they're gonna use trails connecting Franklin Road to Mac Hatcher to Harlemsdale. So the trails would be open to the public in the front. And if they decide to walk in the open space and the internal spaces, I guess they could. Is that what you're asking? Yep. Well, once once Mac Hatcher extension is finished, then you've got that 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 uh, mixed use recreational path that runs along the adjacent to Mac Hatcher. So I I didn't know if there was yeah. going to be a connection to that and yes. how that would it work. Will be. Yes, that Mac Hatcher that multi purpose trail runs parallel to Mac Hatcher on both sides to the north off the page, and then dies as you come down Franklin Road. We would tie into that. Yes, we would. So that would be part of the city's trail system, correct? That's something we need to talk to parks and recreation about, but we will have to do parkland dedication and these trails would be part of that parkland dedication in fees in lieu of. Thank you, Gary. Yep. Ken, is that it? 
Yes, sir, it's all. All right, Kathy Worthington. Um, I don't have any comments at this time. I'm still trying to digest it, but I do think with the the single fam the single units, the reduction in the number of those due to the lot size would alleviate a little bit of the density. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, my only comments are a great concern over the density. Uh, as I see, and I understand what we said about the single family lots, but right now, as it is shown, we have 33 single family lots and uh, the uh, 32 big houses, which equate to, uh, if my math is correct, 128 family living units, uh, or a total combined of 161 living units in these two in these two uh, developments, or this one development on both sides of the road. So that's my big concern, is the uh, increase in volume of traffic in and out of Franklin Road. And from what I see, we've got one, looks like one access point. Uh, so that, uh, um, well, it runs across, but it, one access point, but that's the, so I think that's gotta have some work. Is, is my main concern. I think I, I agree with all the other questions that have been raised and there've been some good questions, but um, that's- So Janet, in relating that to the Historic Zoning Commission's charge for recommendation on lot size configuration, uh, is your, your point that perhaps reconfiguring the lot size would help with the density? I, I think, I mean, a, a reduced number of units is what's gonna help the density. Uh, but however that needs to happen. I understand the concept of what you got here. I think it's a great idea. Uh, but as far as the density, I can't get my arms around 160 more units in this section, these two pieces of property right here. That's, that's my big concern. Uh, and, well, Mr. and Chair, my concern is the same as yours, but for a different reason. Mine is not for the traffic, it's for the character of this area. Well, Thank put you. it all together. I th it's an important <laughs> area. I think everybody agrees with that. These two pieces of property are very, very important to the um, to the entrance into Franklin. Entrance yeah, in and out. Our last rural corridor in the downtown yep. as well put. Yep. Yep. So in, in recapping, um, it sounds like I've, I've heard from most folks that um, the number of single family might need to be adjusted to allow for a larger lot size for single family. And to Ms. Stanenfelser's point, that may affect the number of big houses um, on either side of the development as Franklin Road cuts through it. Um, the uh, applicant has worked really, really hard with staff to bring something forward that can be supported by Envision Franklin. So I do want to thank Christian and Gary yes. um, again for um, the work that they put in. This is, you know, we've seen several renditions and they have been trying to take staff's comments very seriously and, and implement them every time. So thank you very much for that. We do appreciate you coming today and I um, will help you move forward into um, an application for a formal recommendation request. Thank you. All right. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. All discussion. Thank you. All right. We're ready for our next uh, addition to the agenda uh, discussion of alterations masonry at 255 Fourth Avenue South. Neil Piaz. Piaz. So, um, Mr. Chair, I do wish to give oh. a brief little introduction here too, and, and just to thank all the applicants on the line for, the, for their patience as we work through that first item. As I mentioned, it's, uh, it affects a lot more than a single lot. So uh, thank you for that. Okay, um, to refresh everyone's memory, we have uh, Neil here from La Casa de Mi Padre, um, who is uh, serving as the um, church representative for the proposal to paint the building. Uh, as you all know, the building has been partially painted. It is a historic brick building and the historic district design guidelines recommend against the painting of historic masonry. Um, unless there uh, is severe damage caused by um, mortar uh, repairs or water damage, things of that nature. So um, the applicant did stop the painting at the city's request and the Historic Zoning Commission um, did ask Mr. Um, Paez to provide additional information by which to review his request for the painting of the building, specifically 
um, ask for some estimates from folks who would be able to remove the paint from the building. And then the, um, the Historic Zoning Commission also asked for information on how much it's cost to paint the building so far and how much it would cost to finish the painting of the building. Uh, Mr. Paez has provided one estimate from a contractor that he is prepared to speak to today, but I don't have any information from him on you know, how much it would cost to continue to paint as desired by the applicant. So I will go ahead and share his information and, and then turn that over to him, please, to present. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda, and thank you, everyone. Um, I, I don't know how to approach the, the I'm happy to help Neil any way I can. I, I do have okay. this photo to show what okay. the building looks like currently. Um, and then I had, um, here's a photo from Google that shows what the building looked like before painted. Also has the um, the next applicant <laughs> photograph of their building here too. So it happened to work both ways. But so this is a before and this is a current and the applicant um, would like to continue to, to go ahead and finish the whole building that a large part of the side that you see here has not been finished. And then like portions of the gables haven't been finished in certain areas. They would like to proceed with moving forward. And so um, I do have the estimate here if, if uh, you wanna to speak to that, Neil. Yeah, well, um, you asked me and I call a bunch of uh, uh, companies, but uh, as they came and see the scope of the work, um, they were not able, they didn't have the, you know, the technical elements in order to uh, move forward. With the exception, maybe Lee Restoration that never submitted a proposal. Uh, mm -hmm. They are able to, but they were, uh, I don't know the reason, but um, um, they, they didn't send me a proposal. Uh, the only one was uh, uh, Ken uh, Ken Warby or Darby and yes. commercial painting, and you can see the you know what's the elements of the proposal, the cost, and uh, he recommend to apply a water replant, which is five thousand dollars. So uh, that's basically the only proposal that I was able to submit to you. Mm. What are your thoughts on the proposal, Neil? Um, well, basically he's, uh, he's saying that he's able, that he's not gonna damage the, the, the brick. And uh, that he's gonna, you know, protect the, the integrity of, of the brakes and the motor and all of that. So um, he's, he seems very capable of doing that. And he had the technical knowledge and uh, uh, well, well, basically we don't have the money. Uh, what we were doing, uh, painting the church was uh, I raised some funds to buy prime and um, we, of course we didn't finish painting it. Um, I got a, but, a bunch of volunteers that helped me to, to paint. So I don't have a proposal and I cannot tell you how much is to finish the job of painting the church because we were doing it as a church. Do you have any ideas as far as how much you've already primed? Like how many um, well, it was like buckets three, of paint you might need? to $3,000 in prime. Okay, that's helpful. And then, Thank you. Uh -huh. And then uh, it might be, I don't know how much in painting on paint. Okay, that, that is helpful. Thank you for sharing uh -huh. that. And then, uh, um, yeah, prime is the, the most expensive part because it's uh, thick and it's, it should be very lasting. And so the, so the painting would, would probably be the same or less as your estimate. Uh -huh, exactly. Something like okay. that. Thank you for that. 
And just to clarify on this, um, scope of this uh, proposal here presented by commercial painting, is that to remove the applied paint from the entire building or just from the historic portion of the building? Now I, I'm doubting if I, uh, if I mentioned to him the, the fact that we, uh, we in the last meeting, we talked about, you know, the main auditorium, mm -hmm. remove that paint and uh, leave the rest, the back of, uh, you know, the back of the building. Okay, so so you you believe that this proposal is for the yeah. entire building? It, it could be, but uh, now I'm doubting it. Okay. Uh -huh. Now I'm doubting it because if I mentioned to him, probably he. We, I need to go back to. Be clear on on that part. Okay, thank you for that. Do you have anything else you want to add? Well. <laughs> like he'd like, want, like the church would like to continue to paint exactly that i want to fix the church because people are asking me uh, neighbors and uh people and hey neil what do you need in order to move forward do you need help do you need money do you need uh what do you need well it's so nice to hear that the the community is interested in in helping you know move your project um to some sort of finality so that's it's great to hear um, thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Okay, uh, let's let's go to have some response from the commissioner, Susan Besser. Susan, are you there? Sorry, um, this this one hurts my heart. I think because I really understand where the applicant's coming from, and I think about uh, just a block away. Uh, the, uh, at the corner of third and margin, you know, they painted that house. And, uh, and so I could see where you could think that you could do that, even though that house was previously painted. And, you know, that's, but, but again, I think the thing is, is that the, um, you know, he, he, I don't, I honestly think they didn't realize they couldn't, they couldn't, that what they shouldn't do that. So I'm just struggling with this, quite frankly, about how to go forward. But I do appreciate everything that the applicant has done to give us, a, you know, uh, an idea of what it would take to, you know, take the building back to its original. Uh, and that's all I have. Thank you. All right, Brian Lester. Brian Lester, with us. I. Don't see Brian. I do think he had to drop off. Um, okay. Actually, yes, he's gone to get his COVID shots. So. Oh, all right. Yeah. Uh, Lisa Marquardt. Okay, um, Mr. Paez, thank you uh, for what you're trying to accomplish here. I I know it's very complicated and unexpected for you for your congregation. <laughs> I I echo the things that Miss Besser said in terms of our feelings uh, related to what happened. Of course, you know that we are bound as a historic zoning commission to the guidelines that we have in front of us. Um, so having said that, I, I thought that what we had discussed previously is that you were going to have someone remove the paint from a portion of the building in order for the commissioners to be able to see and understand whether or not this was a feasible approach. Am I mistaken on that? No, but Amanda, Lisa, you, why don't you respond to that? Yes, Amanda. Lisa. Um, I did work with the applicant and I, I, I hope that I communicated that well to the commission. I apologize if I didn't, but I did work with the applicant. Um, to us. The city did purchase some uh, historic building safe paint remover. Um, and um, I worked with the applicant to apply it over a weekend. Unfortunately, we were having, it's in the middle of winter. We're having some terrible weather. We were trying to find times where the temperature was un high enough above a um, certain level as recommended by the, um, the solution itself. Um, and when we did that, it happened to fall in an, a time where there was some unpredictable rain. I went ahead and, and 
scheduled it with 30% chance of rain. And of course it rained. And so, um, you know, we tried that a couple of times and it just, um, it, we weren't able to determine um, if that was going to work based on the time of year. Um, but Mr. Paez did say that he was concerned about the cost of, um, and the labor involved in applying that, um, that solution to the building. So that's where, um, you know, taking recommendations from the, the historic zoning commissioners that did work with him to advise that he get um, some estimates from some professional contractors to move forward. So he did certainly try to comply with that. Okay, and, and having said that, Amanda, the, the proposed approach for removing the paint, uh, I'm not familiar with that vapor, uh, whatever that the contract said, uh, some kind of vapor uh, treatment in order to remove the paint. Is that something that you're familiar with? I'm or? not quite as familiar with it, but I do, I am familiar with the contractor based on recommendations I've heard from folks in the community. So um, the contractor does understand this is a historic building and that, you know, protection of the brick is of utmost importance. So I don't believe he would have recommended something that would have been unsafe. Now, certainly we can confirm that before we would, you know, approve that type of activity to take place on this building if that's the direction the commission chooses to move forward. But yeah, um, I don't believe I, I do believe he understands the, the ramifications. And so it would be something that he felt comfortable with for a historic building. Yeah. Uh, well, Mr. Paez, I, I'm not sure if your contractor would be willing to do this, but it, it may be worthwhile uh, just to do a small portion ahead of time uh, as an experiment, so to speak, to see uh, the efficacy of that approach. And, and then uh, if it does turn out to be a, a good approach, it could be submitted, the picture of that portion could then be submitted to historic zoning uh, as part of the approval process, perhaps. Oh, well, at this point, I would love to go back to one of the reasons why I painted the building and was because I saw not too far, probably half a block in the corner, an expensive house, brick, 1810, um, that was painted white. And um, it's not the only one. Um, I saw other houses in the community. And uh, I, I don't know why, it's because of um, the, the, it's an expensive house and- uh, Oh no, Mr. Paez, I will, I'll explain this again. I, I wanna be very clear for the public. The building you're speaking of um, is behind this on the corner of third and south margin. That building was painted almost a brick color. So it was already painted. Now the way that the historic zoning district design guidelines read is if a historic building hasn't been painted before, whether it's brick or stone, if it's some sort of masonry, then um, that requires approval. But if it's been painted before, then um, we don't review the I'm paint. Sorry. I'm sorry, Amanda, but I'm talking about the house in, uh, and I saw before it was sold, I saw the picture because a, a real estate agent sent me the picture of the house. Oh yes, it was approved to be painted in the past. And um, I, I don't know that I, I could speak to that you know, specific commission because these commissioners are not the same commissioners that were reviewing that at that time, but that building had did have um, very extensive water damage on the right elevation. So the elevation that is um, facing South Margin Street. Okay. And I, okay. yeah, and I, I, you know, staff did not recommend approval of that either. You know, staff always recommends denial of painting historic brick. Um, uh, like I said, those commissioners is a different, as a different set of commissioners, but um, I believe the rationale given at the time is that it didn't meet the intent of the guideline for, you know, unless there is extensive damage on the building. Amanda, I was on the commission. Yes. And the problem was there were huge fractures in the brick mm -hmm. and was, and they had to fill them with uh, concrete, concrete so it yes. looks like zigzags going around the building. 
and that's why it was approved to be painted. Once it's painted one time, we don't have control of the, over the color that it is painted the second time. That's something we're looking at in our guidelines. And it's certainly nothing to do with like the oh. building or anything of that nature. I'm going to unshare this so everyone can see each other. Um, but no, um, your building, um, if anything, has is more historic and architectural significance in my building. In my um, opinion. I'm <laughs> Uh, Maybe something's wrong something. with your mic. You're coming through awful garbled. Okay. okay. I'm sorry about that. Lisa, uh, did you have anything else? I just wanted to conclude uh, that perhaps uh, a more sort of empathetic way to approach this would be to, um, to ask Mr. Pius to pursue the removal of the paint from the historic building and perhaps uh, submit a proposal to have historic zoning uh, uh, approve retroactively the painting, uh, the mistaken painting of the non-historic building. That, that would be my comment. Okay. Mary Pierce, you got any other comments? Uh, I, I concur with that concept. Of, All right. Uh, yes. Ken Scalf. I concur also. Kathy Worthington? No, no further comments. OK, I'm, uh, I'm going to go back to what Susan Besser said. I, uh, this, I, and I think I said this is the first time. You got a heart issue and a head issue here. And it's something that we're trying to do with the guidelines. And I think we've got to work. I don't think we have the solution yet. I'm going to come back to Lisa's comment, though, that a perhaps a test issue be uh, done working with commercial painting company who I'm very familiar with. Uh, and, uh, and I'll be glad to work with Amanda and Mr. Paez and, and talk to that company so that we can collectively do what I think Lisa had, had come up with and see if we can't come up with a solution before Mr. Paez comes back uh, to, the, uh, to the commission. So if, if everybody's okay with that, let, I'd like to just go in that direction. Uh, and I'll work with Amanda and Mr. Piaz and see if we can't come up with some kind of proper solution so that this can get resolved for, for this congregation. Am I clear now or am I still cutting out? No, you're fine now. Okay. I did want to state that, you know, as far as, you know, the way that guidelines read, um, I do think staff would find that this portion of the building is far more historic than the yeah. addition portion. So if the addition portion was decided to be, you know, continue to be painted, I do think staff um, could, could support that if this portion um, was to be rectified, um, if, if that's how the commission would, would seek to move right. forward. But, but I'm I... happy to, to work with, with you and and Neil to, to see if we can get a, a test done by commercial painting to see if yeah. it's even possible. Okay, and I think that's, I think we need to find out what that proposal actually included as far as the removal of the paint. Correct. Because I'm not sure I'm, if I think it was the, it might be the whole thing. I thought it both, was. Both uh, sections of the building rather than just the uh, historic building. So okay. if we can uh, we'll proceed in that direction. Mr. Chair, uh, I just have, this is Susan, I just have one more comment. Okay. If, the, uh, if you just if if a decision is to leave this one painted, I would recommend that it be painted a brick color, so that it blends with the original brick, and not be white. Which which part? The the non historic portion or the, the non historic the... portion? I would recommend that it be painted a brick color, to blend better with the original brick. If that's what we if that's what we go back to. And Ms. Besser, I do want to, to be clear that, you know, that recommendation could be made by this commission and, and that could be conditioned by this commission, but ultimately a different yes. owner or a different user of the building could paint the building whatever color they choose right. to do so. Okay. Right. Thank you. Okay, does anybody have anything else? Otherwise we're gonna move on. Mr. Payez, we will be back in touch. Just, uh, just uh, to remember, I start painting our building, our property, 
And uh, I, I don't know the nature between private property uh, and and the city, frankly, you know, because I, I, I'm coming from Venezuela. Venezuela, the state owns everything. And then I feel, I feel like uh, some sort of, uh, you know, lack of freedom in, in even in, in United States. And um, I feel, it feels awkward. It feels uh, weird because of, uh, um, I, I feel like I, I, we are not being free, you know, to paint our building. I started uh, October 31st. And then uh, it's been a few months and um, our building is awful. Uh, and I don't know, you know, it's, uh, you are telling me uh, we're gonna be walking alongside you, but I don't know what that means. You know, it's to, to give us uh, advice, to give us uh, suggestions. But at the end, I feel like uh, we're gonna be doing whatever is imposed on us. Then uh, uh, I just want to kind of be clear exactly. Um, and I, I just want to be respectful, but I, that those are my feelings. Well, I certainly respect your feelings and thank you for sharing that. We really do appreciate, you know, your patience with us as we try to help you come up with something that could, you know, achieve, you know, what your church desires, but at the same time, because achieves that the community values have been, you know, been placed on the history. You're telling history. me, Neil, you have to remove the pain and that's it. You have that's, to remove it. That's not what I am that's hearing not what today. We're hearing. Okay, no. we, because at the end, at the end of the day, uh, removing the pain is going to be expensive. Yes. And then uh, uh, who's going to pay for that? You know, I want to be clear because otherwise I have to start working and raising the money to remove the pain, Do not to make it longer and longer. And, uh, you know, I don't. I, I understand your frustration. So I'll be very clear. Right now, the there has not been a formal application brought to the commission considering this building. So if you want to work with me, I can certainly assist you in providing the information on how to submit a formal application to the Historic Zoning Commission to paint the building. What I've been inviting you to in the meantime are a series of informal meetings, including this one, during which the Historic Zoning Commission members through this design review committee process can provide some feedback that would give them the information that they need individually to make a collective decision on whether or not it would approve an application where you just submit one. So right now there is no application, but what I've been hearing from these folks is that, you know, in good faith, they'd want to try to help you, but they need more information from you in order to make a decision that would impact other buildings in the community as well because the decisions they make, even though they're contextual, could have implications on how other buildings are perceived if someone else asked to paint. So uh, they'd like to see if Mr. Darby's proposal is even feasible for you, how that would work. And so, uh, you know, Jim Roberts and I are happy to help you, you know, do that so that they don't ask you to remove the paint if it's not successful to remove the paint. So right now that's exactly where we are. It's like, we wanna help you do a, a spot clean again um, and we'll see what that might cost and if there's any help that we can provide for that. But if um, we were to do a spot clean then we would know, hey, this does work or hey, it won't work. And so then the commission, once you submit a formal application can make a decision that includes all the information they need in order to make a very educated decision and not impose a decision on you that may not be the best for that building or for yourself. Because is that I, helpful? Yeah, but you're telling me no. It's it's a decision the best for you. No, it's the best for for for, for the zoning committee. <laughs> well, for the community. That's this is a series okay. of guidelines that have well, been approved we, by we, the we, community. Well, yeah. And and these are these are there is an extra layer of protection on these historic structures that comprise our historic districts in Franklin. And they, they are special. And so there are specific guidelines that apply to all of the buildings within that historic preservation overlay district. And, and, you, and your building is one of them. Uh, what, what we're saying is we'll follow up with you after this meeting this week 
to work with you and the contractor to do a test patch of the building with good weather because it didn't work well when the weather was bad and the temperatures were cold to see if the paint removal is effective in good weather and then we can bring that back to the historic zoning commission with your application and in this in, the, in that time frame as well you can talk with the commercial contractor to see if that estimate included the entire building or if that was just the historic portion of the structure. So there's a little bit more information that we're going to try to work on and then we can bring that to the upcoming because, historic uh, zoning commission. But Amanda will, Mr. Payette, Amanda will get with you tomorrow and set up a meeting where the three of us can visit and, and get in touch with the contractor and we can find out more information that will be applicable to this other commission members so that we can make a educated decision on what needs to happen from our perspective and then uh we'll, we'll just have to go from there i don't know what that's going to be but the let's other, the other option would be to invite ken darby the owner that's, that's what we'll talk about i i know him so i i will we'll we'll uh we'll work on that tomorrow amanda will set up something with you tomorrow Yes, we'll get definitely. together. I just want to understand my heart. It's been months, mm -hmm. and I haven't. We uh, haven't. We it. understand. I understand. It's a, and we're trying to work this out where it makes some sense to you. And I know you're out money on this, plus your uh, your uh, congregation time, the members of your congregation who've worked on this project, and I know you're getting pushback from them as well as other people in the community. So. We're all sensitive to that. So stay tuned with Amanda. I'll get in touch with you tomorrow. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. We really appreciate you. Thank you. All right. The next item is discussion of alterations accessory at 245 Fourth Avenue South. Heather Joel, applicant. Heather and Thanks for your Heather patience, Joel. Bill and Heather. Thank hey. You. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. Okay, I'm going to pull up your the proposal you sent me. If you wouldn't mind sharing some information about that, that'll be helpful. So um, you guys saw the picture of their house. I, I believe I put it in here too. It oh. happens to be right next to the church we just talked about. So um, I'm going to scroll down just so you guys can see that again. Can you all see? This is the home here. Very beautiful home. Okay. All right, Heather. Hi, thank you guys for um, hearing us and considering kind of what we're wanting to do with our little backyard garage. Um, so as you can see, um, well, yeah. yeah. Go ahead. <clears throat> Picture on the left yeah. is the existing structure. Um, and these doors, uh, I don't know what, what, when this would have been built um, obviously, it's not sort of, you know, it was not there when this when the original structure was built, but um, these old garage doors are rotting away and there's not really not much can be done. It's kind of a gravity situation. It's not so much rot, actually. It's really just they're falling apart. And so it's, and we've we've tried on several occasions to fix them. And we, <laughs> <laughs> they're getting a little changed. Yeah. And a little sad. So the idea is, you know what, either, you know, what do we do? Um, rebuild these doors, put new doors on, or reface the front of this building. And um, so at the latter is our desire. We'd love to sort of reface it, make it look a little more, because it's not a, it's, it's not a functional garage, you know, no one drive, you can't drive back there. And so this is the sort of idea we thought, well, let's make it, let's put some, let's cutesy it up. Yeah, let's cutesy it up. And put, change the frontage and, uh, this the um, picture that you're showing right now, Amanda, is it's like almost identical to the structure that's currently there. That same dimensions. Same dimensions, and so we were just hoping that um, we could make it a little more, uh, I guess, cottagey looking. Um, you can't see it from the street. It's just really like our, our back door. Um, yeah. But yeah, so we just wanted to kind of cutify it. And that's, sorry about that picture of me. I didn't know you were going to show that to everybody. <laughs> <laughs> but, 
That's the uh, storehouse number nine down the it's street. It's just a little awning they have over the front. Uh, which I, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to embarrass you with that. I do, I do think it helps them understand where you're coming. Yeah, from. no, you're totally fine. The reason that photo is in because it has the little awning um, across the right. front, which is right. indicative of something we'd like to try and do. Um, yeah. Well, thank you for that. I do think it's really helpful. And I'm going to go back to the photo of the house or the out, sorry, that out. Yeah, really, what we, um, the example that you had shown, it's not like a ton different. It's, it's pretty similar. Um, so we're not, you know, wanting to do something extensive, just something kind of minor. Yeah. I understand. Thank you for that. Jim, do you want me to jump in? Okay, so he's muted, but I think you said go ahead. So the um, the historic district design guidelines do recommend that one preserve and maintain historic outbuildings. I don't know the exact age on this building, but I do know it, it is a historic building and that it's over 50 years in age or could be historic with over 50 years in age. I do think it has architectural character indicative of a lot of outbuildings that we have in downtown Franklin and, and in Hinchyville area. So. I, I do think that it's worthy of preservation. I certainly understand as far as the, you know, the needs to, you know, replace occasionally for um, garage doors and um, histor you know, with historic equivalents. So our guidelines would recommend that if these garage doors are irreparable, that they would be, you know, replaced in kind, meaning that they um, have a similar look to what's currently there. That's not to say that you wouldn't be able to make those fixed doors where, you know, you could probably make them look like garage doors, but not necessarily function like garage doors. That is an, uh, a possibility here. And I think there are ways to add a little bit more character to the, to the building without um, removing the, uh, the thing that makes it appear as a garage, which would be these doors. So in, in um, deference to the design guidelines that we have for outbuildings, I would recommend that if these doors can't be maintained as they are, physically are, that they be replaced to be something comparable to what's there and maybe their functionality changes. And so that, you know, you could have a greater use of the building because it can't be used as a, as a vehicular garage. Maybe it could be used for something different to get at what you're desiring to do. Um, I'd love to hear the feedback from the commissioners. Mm -hmm. uh, Jim, do you mind unmuting, please? And unmuting. Uh, Susan Besser. Uh, I would concur with what Amanda is saying that um, I think that uh, replacing the doors is, uh, if they're really in that bad of shape, is appropriate and something that would be, that would be comparable to what's already there and really i don't know that um adding a lot of detail is what i would like to see on this building i think really the simpler the better thank you okay how about brian oh, it's brian brian's gone right amanda and lisa marquardt yeah um, the, the other thing that our guidelines indicate is that uh, uh, in, in these historic buildings, even these buildings, which uh, get neglected over time because it's not the main house. So we understand how this happens and uh, you, the pictures you presented of the, of the damage done over time is uh, something that, of course, we use as a commission to decide, well, uh, is, is it possible to, to uh, repair these or is replacement in kind the, the correct approach? Uh, it may be for you, but uh, the idea of a, a, a new opening, as you had shown in um, one of the photos that you presented, that's, that's not something I think we could support. Um, I do appreciate that, that you're not looking to change it dramatically, as you said, uh, but there may be an option, as Amanda was saying, for uh, perhaps finding doors that are new, but similar, would, or even repair what's there. So that's what we would have to know as a commission. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mary Pierce? Um, I 
I think that you are in a home and this garage that are in a spectacular original condition and have been amazing stewards of the house. Thank you. Thank you. It looks incredible. I think the option I would prefer is pretty much what Amanda described, that you leave it to read like garage doors, but maybe just one or two of the doors are functioning so that it would would make it more usable to you. I actually think that the metal awnings compared to your house are not nearly as sophisticated as the house and um, sometimes less is more. Thank you. Ken Scalf. Yeah, <clears throat> yes, I, I concur with what the other commissioners have said. If, if you could um, <clears throat> maintain the look but change the functionality of how those doors swing so that it makes it more usable. I think that's a good approach. Thanks. Uh, Kathy Worthington. Um, I really don't have anything else to add, although the inspiration photos are, are really a nice guide for us to see and feel what your intent is of the space. But, um, uh, have have you considered, you know, getting um, professional advice on maybe how to address and accomplish your look and still meet some of the things that would be successful for uh, accordance to the guidelines? Thank you. Sure. Thanks. And I don't I don't have anything else to add other than what other commissioners have said. Uh, do you all have any other questions? Amanda, you have any other comments? Uh, I just want to offer that I'm, I'm happy to, to speak to you both um, more and e even visit the site with you if that's something you'd like and maybe we can come up with a solution that that makes that building usable for you because um, it is certainly a, a, you know something I would want for anyone that has a building to be able to use it in a way that's functional for you but at the same time you know maintain you know the semblance of, of it being you know garage doors there. Um, I, I agree wholeheartedly with Ms. Pierce that you, you have a spectacular home. And I think the awning might, might um, read as a different architectural style than your home. So perhaps we can look at options maybe on the back side of the, of the outbuilding, maybe creating a, a pedestrian door there where you have some, uh, a covering there. So it's a little bit of a porch area off the back of it. Okay. But I'll have I'll be happy to reach out to you. I'll, I'll reach out to you and see if there's something if you want to meet again and talk some more. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Um, a quick question I have: um, what what deems this building historic and significant, other than the fact that it's 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 on our property? Well, uh, that's a great question. Thank you for is there, asking. Is there is there some sort of official um, sort of definition as to what a historic building is down here in in downtown Franklin? Sure. So um, the historic um, historic districts are created for different reasons. The ones that we have, the, the historic districts we've established downtown are mainly for architectural purposes. Uh, the National Register of Historic Places has um, listed Franklin's downtown area on its list worthy of preservation and has identified each building that is historic specifically, including right. your own. And it also identifies um, what's called a a contributing outbuilding, meaning a building that adds to the character, the architectural character of the district. And so your building's considered um, contributing and, and adding to that character. So it meets an age and architectural threshold in order to do so. And I'm happy to send you more information on that too. If and like. so 50 years, 50 years of age, is that the, that's the threshold? That is typically the threshold because the federal government has established that most buildings need to be 50 years in age to be considered historic. Now, that doesn't mean every building that's 50 years old or older is historic, but that is a threshold by which it's considered. There are very few exceptions, like Graceland was listed before it was 50 because it was Elvis's home. <laughs> but, right. but most of the time, a building has to have some established age before um, the federal government um, um, and we, as a municipal government and state government, always take our leads from the federal government on how we want to, to move forward with those. Sure. So um, so our, our, our approved documentation from the federal government lists were um, your two buildings as historic. And so that's what we use to kind of help guide us. Great. Um, so Amanda, so we'll connect after this with you. 
Um, and then do we have to come back to another? You wouldn't necessarily need to come back to, to another one of these meetings, but you, you would need to get approval from the Historic Zoning Commission to make any alterations. And I'm happy to help you with that as well. Okay, great. Thank you all. Appreciate great, thanks, it. Thank and you. again, thanks for your patience as we work through the, the other two projects. Okay, thanks. Thanks. All right, bye. we're ready for great. item number four, discussion of alterations. Storefront at 415 Main Street. Is that applicant on the line with us? Yes, yep, I'm here. I believe we have um, Carrie from mm -hmm. Ever Eve, as well as folks uh, who are um, building owner representatives and Our, tenant representatives, correct? Uh, so the building owner had to drop off. Okay. Um, but I, I'm not sure if our store manager, Shelly, is still on I or not. I think she is here. Oh, good. Good, good. Um, yeah, so it's the two of us that are still here. Yes. Well, thank you for hanging with us as we work through this. So I've got your item pulled up. Feel free to, to share your proposal and then I'll jump in. Great. So I wanted to start off with, by just showing you kind of the, um, the context of the street on where we're located. So what we're looking to do um, is kind of mimic some of the existing architecture that's already there on the, the storefront designs. So if you go to the next slide, you can see this is our storefront. Um, the two windows, if you're looking at the picture on the right side, the two windows, bays of windows that are right there. Uh, are our two, like it, basically the full width of our storefront. And so you can see there's no actual entrance from the street, from the sidewalk to get into our store. Um, so what we are pro proposing is adding a storefront entrance to that store and following some of the same architecture uh, as what other storefronts are doing. So if you go to the next, um, this is just to show you a little bit of context right now of where the, um, the entrances into the store, it's through a shared vestibule with the other tenant. And then this is our proposal. So it's basically taking the left bay of those windows, um, yep, right there, and taking those out and putting in a double door entry with a transom and side lights on either, on both sides of the doors. And it, this would, again, mimic some of the other architecture and details around um, double doors and the, the transom in the side windows as well. And if you go to the next, you can see uh, a little bit about the, the, a little bit more with the detail below the windows that is very similar to some of the other storefronts um, there as well. And then our signage on the exterior, we would be matching very similar to our, to the adjacent tenant um, that's next door to us that we share their space. And you can go to that next um, slide. There you go. So this, this is unlit letters. They're black, um, nine inches high, and just our, our type centered over the door. And then we have in the windows on either side of the door, if you go to the next slide, we have little um, every stickers that are in the, I mean, they're not stickers, they're actually 3D. Decals. They have a little bit of thickness. Yeah, decals too um, on the windows as well. So this is a recessed entry into the space. So it's not flush with the storefront anymore so that the doors are able to be open without impeding on the sidewalk. Is there anything else you want to add, Carrie? No, I think that that is it for now. I'm open to any questions. Oh, thank you. Okay, so um, I'll, I'll just go ahead and share my comments. Um, I did uh, speak with Carrie um, about this proposal. Um, and as I do with any proposal for storefront alterations on, um, in downtown areas, um, I do look to historic precedent and to historic photographs. So um, most of you may be familiar with this building. This is um, where Parks Realty used to be before they relocated. And um, there is the shared vestibule and then philanthropy um, is the tenant on the either si um, other side here. Um, this historically has had a number of automotive functions. So these used to actually be car bays um, where people could drive their vehicles in. So, so at some point in time, when it no longer needed or served that purpose, um, these storefronts were added and there were, um, in lieu of bulkheads, there were, um, because there was no entry here, um, there was brick added um, to enclose that. So um, in, in 
looking at that and providing advice to Carrie, my recommendation was to do something very simple and traditional here um, to have um, some knee walls, bulkheads um, that are indicative of what you see um, on surrounding buildings. And that's why Carrie had provided those photographs of what they referenced. Um, this storefront is currently a, a aluminum storefront. They'd like to keep that. I it was not clear until um, this, this conversation that this was a recessed entrance. And so that is something I'd like to discuss a little bit more, like how recessed it is from, um, from where it currently is, like dimensionally, how many inches that is recessed in. Um, but ultimately, I do think they're, um, they follow the recommendations I provided as far as the guidelines and having a traditional style storefront entrance with your transom lights, your, your um, single light glass doors, and your bulkheads that are similar to what you see up and down the street. Um, I do think that the, the lettering um, meets the intent of the guidelines as well, and it's very similar to what you see on um, some adjacent buildings as far as the individual letters that are channel letters and um, not lit. Um, do you mind, Carrie, um, providing a little bit more about that um, the recession so that it's clear yep. to everybody? So they are recessed one foot basically from where the- I see that, okay. Yeah, that, well, that's actually not how it's shown on my current plan. That's, that's bigger than that. That's three foot on that plan. Sorry about that. I was looking at an older plan. That's okay. So this, these walls would be pulled up so that when the doors open, they don't swing out onto the public street. Correct, correct. Okay, okay that's very helpful. Thank you. And I, I don't have any more to add, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Would you like to unmute? I can hear you because you're behind me. <laughs> I don't think I'm, anyone... sorry. I'm sorry. I was... <laughs> All right. Now we'll try that. Susan Besser. Um, it looks like they have done this relative to preservation brief 11, which would be keeping it very simple and, uh, you know, still keeping the, like the transom bulkhead, you know, the layout of a typical storefront. So uh, I, 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 as long as I've been on the commission, I've never seen anything like this. And I'm assuming that this is something they can do because Amanda, you've talked to them, but uh, I don't uh, overall have any problems with it. Thank you. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> Lisa Marquardt. Yeah, uh, uh, I agree with uh, Ms. Besser. It's, uh, it, it's, an, it's an unusual proposal, but at the same time, it, it seems to make all the sense in the world. And uh, the way it's been presented is very, very tasteful. It's very uh, much in context with the, the buildings around it and it, it, it could probably be happen without uh, the building looking extremely different. Thank you. Thanks. Mary Pierce. Uh, I don't really have anything else to add. I agree. Ken Scaff. Nothing further to add. Kathy Worthington. Same here. Tastefully done. And I would Echo that, all of these comments. Very well done. Wonderful. Thanks, Carrie, for yeah. taking my, my comments. Look how easy it is. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. I appreciate all your time and your help, Amanda. That was, it was wonderful to, to work with you on it. So thank you. Thank you. I'll be in touch tomorrow and give you information on how to move forward. Perfect. Good night, everyone. Thanks. Good night. Thank you. Thanks for your patience. All right, we're ready for uh, new construction, 143 Splendor Ridge Drive. This is lot eight, Chad Gore. Mr. Chair, I'm going to have to leave for a minute. I don't know if anybody else needs a cup. Well, everybody else is at home. Need a break? Okay, I think She's, we can move on, Amanda. I, I'm, I'm fine with that if everyone else is. Uh, Chad Gore. Yes, sir. Okay, we're Chad, ready for I... Lot eight. I have everything you submitted this this today, so I'm just going to share your new packet, okay. right? Okay. Yes. Well, that's fine. I sent you some individual images, but I think you probably handled all that. So I, I think I have those too. Okay. okay. I wasn't able to combine them in time, but I, I do have those. That's okay. Sorry about that. That's okay. Okay. We're starting with eight. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, hopefully... 
my presentation is a little bit familiar at this point, but you can see we're going to talk about lot eight and lot 12, but first lot eight, uh, I've kind of darkened in the four lots you guys have approved for us already. Right. That's what I was going to ask. I'm... There you go. Uh, and so lot eight is kind of a missing tooth right now. It was a bigger lot and took a, an extra few steps in design. So uh, uh, next slide, please. This is the, the lot layout, however, is pretty similar. Lot eight, uh, just like lot 12, lot eight is wider in the front, but it's about the same uh, in the back as the rest of the lot. So what that allows us to do is kind of kick that garage out at a slight angle so that the front of the house can be wider and the driveway can still get by it. Um, and so we've taken the opportunity there to move some of the massing of the house toward the front and have a um, slightly bigger first floor than we would have on uh, on the other lots that are smaller in the front. Um, and Chad, I'll really just add, when Ms. Pierce gets back, we may want to cover this um, garage configuration again, just so it's clear for her as well. Okay, sure. Okay. Uh, you, we can see, I'm going to let's back up one again. Sure. We can see from here, and I think we talked about this uh, with lot seven last month. Um, our first few submittals and approvals for that matter had the retaining wall across, uh, right behind the sidewalk to help mm -hmm. bring up the grade uh, more abruptly in the front of the lots. We've since discovered that's not going to be allowed. So you'll see here, well, in big bold letters, the 10 foot PUDE kind of got uh, all of our <laughs> uh, So um, we have, uh, just like on lot seven, and as we're going to go back and do on lots uh, nine, 10, 11, I think we've already talked about this, but we'll just uh, slope the grade up from uh, quickly from the back of the sidewalk um, so that the yard, front yard of the house is elevated a little bit to sort of mitigate the, um, what otherwise might look like a little bit too high above the curb. Okay, that makes sense. Um, Do you wanna okay. cover this quickly? From sure. Okay. Uh, Mary, we were talking about how this lot is a little bit wider in the front though, but it's kind of the same width in the back. So what that lets us do is uh, kind of kick the garage out at a little bit of an angle so that the driveway, we can make the front of the house wider uh, and the driveway can still get by on one side of it. Uh, Mary, you can you see, were, yeah, so you can kind of see this is on a, a little bit of a curve. So that's why it creates that. I just wanted, because I know looking at it flat, it might look like the garage isn't aligned with the house. So I wanted to just cover that with you. Mm -hmm. So it's clear why Thank that you. is. Okay. Uh, probably not much to see here. It's the same as the site plan. I guess we're okay. most interested in the elevations, but you can see we got front porch, uh, a fully covered front porch. Uh, and well, rear porch uh, facing the river back there. Um, roof plan we may come back to, but um, we can just look at the elevations. I'm sure. making an effort here on, on these two larger lots to have a less than two story elevation. Um, so while there's still plenty of space upstairs, uh, we tried to tuck as much of it as I could under the roof. Um, I'm kind of going with a little bit of a I don't know, Italian eight farmhouse kind of thing. Um, I can't think of anything specific here that might be pertinent to you guys other than just the overall look of it. So maybe just next slide. Yes, I, I, the only thing I wanted to uh, just cover is a, a little bit of Italian eight inspiration. And then you've got um, with the, uh, are these um, metal or? Um, wood, wood, two by two wood railing. Okay, thank you. And then anything the overall you want to cover on the right side. I'm sorry. Anything you want to cover on the right side? Uh, I don't think so. We've changed materials there as the massing changes. Uh, so brick to siding. Um, if if uh, anybody wants to see that on the plan, um, we can point it out. But um, yeah, let's back up one more. Uh, go back to the floor plan. I'll just show you where the material changes. You can see how the front of the house is much wider. And so the material changes there kind of at the master bathroom and at the kitchen, the great room corner. Um, hopefully that makes sense. An inside corner. Yes, sir. Um, yeah, I think we covered that. Um, and then we can see on the rear the, uh, you know, two porches overlooking the river. By the way, the first house is framed over there. Mm -hmm. And the view off of that upper porch is, is incredible. So I think we're going to see, we're going to continue to do that. <laughs> and um, um, the commissioner should drive um, at Bicentennial. You can see it from there. So they'll give you a sense of, uh, you know, moving forward, how that, how will look. 
Good. Um, I have nothing specific to cover here, I don't think. Obviously, you may, you guys may have questions. Yeah, I think I'll just open it to questions, Amanda, unless, you, unless there's anything you think I should cover. Oh, how about we look at the image, the uh, 3D images? That's what I was about to ask you, if yeah. you are okay with that. Okay, sure. I'm going to stop share. And bear with me, these are individual files. I didn't have time to, to combine them, but we'll do the... Um... If you ever want to, uh, if you ever want me to pull up that SketchUp model on my screen and just spin it around, if that's easy, easy you know, to see. Would you mind, would you mind doing that? Yeah, if you don't mind giving me just a minute to pull it up. Sure. I had a site visit right before this, and so I just didn't. Well, I'm sorry, I peppered you with that stuff kind of at the last minute. <laughs> so. okay. Uh, you have to, I guess, enable screen share for me. There. I thought I, I thought I had. Hmm. So try Let's again. Try All right. It did it for a second and then it quit. One more time. Well, I don't know why it keeps unclicking. Sorry about that. Is it working? Yeah. Yes. You guys see that? Yes. Yeah. Good. 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 Okay. This is this is a uh, lot. Where are we? Lot eight, right? Yes. <laughs> There's lot eight. Um, well, it should match the elevations. As I as I tend to say every time we look at these, the elevations are much more finished than the model is. This is really just about uh, massing and scale uh, and help visualize some of the relationships. But you can see the garage fully in the rear. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it helps to see how it fits in the rest of the streetscape too. Chad, I have to say, this is always so helpful when you do this. Um, thank you so much for taking Good. the time. It's helpful for me too. <laughs> do, you, um, do you have anything that might yeah. show the sides at all? Yeah, well, <laughs> not really. You can well, see I mean, what, even, what even that there. helps. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> okay. Does everyone understand the garage relationship? Got it. Okay, cool. Okay. Uh, I'm happy to point out anything on there if you want me to, but otherwise um, I'll let you guys tell me what you think. Um, okay. I'd love to pull up the elevations again once you guys start giving your comments. So um, is there anything else you wanna see on the uh, flyby? Okay, good, because he's already closed it. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> I jumped the gun. Okay, we're ready for comments. You had anything else to add, Amanda? Um, I just wanted to say that, you know, um, Chad ha has taken direction really well as far as some of our initial um, meetings and, you know, initial buildings we've worked through. Um, I'm very excited about this one and a half story. I think that the um, inspiration for architecture and um, the details are all, all fantastic. I um, know that, that because of the configuration of the lot that the, the garage is sitting a little less typically than you might see on some of the others, but I do think in person it will feel more natural than if he tried to force it to, to line um, the way that the others do. Um, the only question I really had um, for this particular one was answered by the roof plan. So I wanted to understand a little bit more about how these side elevations work, specifically their right side. So. Um, I'm happy to pull that back up um, so that you all can see this. It might be more meaningful to some of us than others, but, but ultimately um, it, it does push in here. And I'll go back to the elevations. You can see what I'm talking about. So this is all pushed back from this form. That's right. That, that where sense. you see the double window there in the siding, it is push two feet back from the kind of side door there, two feet in vertical, vertical plane back from that side door. Okay, so I, I don't really have anything to um, add as far as, you know, the guidelines go. I think he, he understands the, um, the intent of the guidelines and it has executed this really well. Thank you so much for your submittal today. Amanda or Chad, can you give us the overall height, the lot size and footprint? Uh, the heights on the elevations, 
I can't that, do, I can't yeah, we'll have to zoom in there, I guess. Yeah, I um, had that written down and then I left that at home. So this height is just under 32 feet. That's to the FFE, just to be clear. There's probably, it varies, but let's say it gets up to maybe four feet to the to grade from there. So it's going to be 36. Yes. Okay, so that's under the 39. That is mm -hmm. the cap for, for these buildings. And then the lot coverage is one thing that, and thank you, Jim, for bringing that up. That's another thing I, I wanted him to cover too. I don't mm -hmm. know that I, that was on this plan set. Unless the I missed site it. plan should have it. Well, there, and you yeah, can see 30. it there as well. Um, is it 39? 30, 39. Yeah, okay. under 39. Okay, so um, staff will need to recommend denial on this based on lot coverage. Um, <clears throat> As, as you all are aware that the buildings that have come forward, the initial four have been approved with um, overages um, all under 40%, but, um, but over 35%. And so staff's recommendation will stand with the guidelines. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, Susan Besser. Uh, I don't have any comments, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, Lisa Marquardt. Uh, could I just see on the right elevation, there's a portion that uh, is not clear. On the right there, uh, yes, right where your cursor is. Yeah, what is that? I, I can't really tell. You know, this is one of those oddball things because the garage is at an angle. You're right. seeing, what you're seeing is the front of the garage at a skewed viewpoint. So what you're seeing is what looks like really, really skinny garage doors, but that's, that's the front of the garage as seen from a very slight angle. Oh, okay. So you're seeing like dimensionally like the space like between yeah. the garage door and, and oh, the, the wall okay. right uh -huh. here. So it, right. it's really just this. I see. And then uh, is this the first outdoor chimney we've seen or did the others have? The others I went back and added and with Amanda's help um all, all in cover i think we had them on, on lot seven as well as when it was approved. yes we did okay so two chimneys is is uh is typical of what we're seeing in this development yes i think it will be mm -hmm. um okay. I, one thing i'd asked chad about um before is making sure that those are you know subservient um, most of them you really can't see from the road uh, based mm -hmm. on where they are and where they're positioned so um and he has has kept his word on that Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. That's all. Thanks. Thanks, Lisa. Uh, Mary Pierce. Uh, the only comment I would have, because when I looked at the, the same thing Lisa did, do, do the lighting selections come back to staff for approval? I don't I, think we, so. We haven't had that. Um, that is something that, you know, we can definitely ask for if that's something you'd like to see as part I of the would. packet. I would. What, what are you looking for, Mary? Just what kind of out exterior lighting selections are being made. For all of the exterior lighting or the garage in particular? Oh, I would say on the houses for all of it. Okay. Is there a characteristic that you're looking for just something for, historically i think variety and uh, uh something that goes with the style of the particular house i think you'll do it anyway but it would just be reassuring. <laughs> i would want to know what the vehicle for submitting that is we usually submit all our things with our permit but we're not going to have those selected when we submit for permit so i'll just have to get with amanda and figure out how to actually do that <laughs> I, I would i would like for it just staff approval. Okay, we can certainly work on that. Um, the, the way the guidelines read, um, Chad, is that the um, the lighting should be, you know, simple, unobtrusive, should be something indicative of the architectural style of both the building and the surrounding district. So I have no doubt that's your intent here. Um, to Ms. Pierce's point, you know, with garages, we do have a tendency from lots of, of folks in the community that, to want to put awnings over or to do other things to kind of articulate that what can sometimes be an odd area between the, the bottom of the eave and the top of the garage doors. And so um, you, I know you're making a conscious effort to make those different for, for all the buildings and mm -hmm. um, you know, not always use an awning or ask the commission about an awning in certain locations. And so um, I think to, to her point, she's just wanting to see some variety up and down the street and that not all the, the light fixtures are the same light fixtures. Is sure. that correct, Mary? 
Okay. Yeah, I, and I would agree with Mary about that. Okay, good scalp. Yes, uh, I don't have any real comments. I, I appreciate the street scene uh, elevation. That really helps to kind of see the massing of one house compared to the next. That's really good. And I'm just curious, the recent flood, how close did the water get? I didn't get over there, but I know that all of this was brought up, was actively brought out of the floodplain and it, there wasn't any damage on any of the lots. So, but I can't tell you exactly how close it got. There was. Um, if I walked over there, I could see where the mud line is, but I haven't. Yeah, yeah. the neighborhood behind did have some flooding. Yeah. yeah. Lancaster. Yes. Harpeth Meadows. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, Kathy Worthington. Uh, no additional comments. I think it looks great. Thank you. And I don't have any other comments. I do too. I think it looks great. Thank you. Amanda, anything else for no. this one? Okay. No. All right, let's roll on to the next one. We're on a roll. Okay, so Number the next six. one. It's 167 Splendor Ridge, lot 12. Okay, Chatham will pull that up. Okay. Here we go. Hold okay, on. the site, the shape of the site is very similar to lot eight, but the, it's not exactly the same dimensions. So um, it, the, I guess the layout or the thought behind the garage position is the yeah. same. Uh, and in fact, the floor plan is not, it's pretty similar, but um, we'll see that the elevations are quite different. The, so you'll see again, the garage is kind of kicked out at an angle just to make a little more room in the front of the lot for actual building. And just like the other, um, we will have a kind of a steep slope just behind the uh, sidewalk to, uh, to break up the, the run from a vertical run from sidewalk to house. Um, yeah, that's about it. And we have um, more of a Tudor flavor here. And while not fully two stories, uh, we're somewhere between one and two stories. I don't know what you would call this in, in the language of Historic Zoning Commission, but it's between one and two stories if you ask me. Um, uh, anything particular, got a little bit of a, of a porch, but not fully covered uh, like the other. Uh, brick, a bay window that's fully veneered in brick on the front. Um, and then cantilevered floor system, as is typical with Tudor, um, with some little uh, corbels below. Thank you. Um, and you can see the garage peeking out there. There's a little more, yeah. And so you're going to see that the entire upper story of the main mass of the house is that um, half timbered look. Um, let's look maybe at the I, we couldn't see the right elevation. Well, maybe this is easier to see. So right. I want another, to see this right here, the cantilever. Okay, thank you. And another fun little thing that uh, Tudor style does sometimes is this paired gable mm -hmm. that lets me kind of keep some uh, upper story mass without the roof getting really, really tall. Um, so I like, I think that's a fun um, definable kind of characteristic. Um, and lots of windows on the back half but you can see we're breaking we're breaking materials at the same outside corner mm -hmm. um as we and did this is for Sustin, how many feet uh it's it's about three feet difference okay. there i don't remember exactly what we can see on the floor plan if we need to uh and the rear is very similar to lot uh eight with a double porch and uh, a little bit on a window from the, we've got a little room above the garage there. So I want to make sure that that room gets a view of the river as well. <laughs> oh, right here? Uh, above oh, the garage. Oh, above oh, the garage. Yeah, right sorry. there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, and did I miss an elevation? Uh, it was just hidden on the first page that you're. Oh, sorry, right here. Yeah, and so uh, this is the same double gable that runs its way all the way across the house, but one is not quite as long as the other, so they look to overlap. This is one, and you were right, Amanda, this is much easier to see maybe in the model or in the roof plan, but mm -hmm. that's just the um, appearance of those double gables being uh, different lengths. So now that we've talked about this, I'm going to go back to the roof plan. So maybe that'll be a little more clear to you mm -hmm. guys. So this is the side that we just saw. And this is the side that has the, the two double gables that match in height. So yeah. you see gable, gable, and then um, Chad, if you want to point to where you want me to go, you yeah, might be able to uh, some stuff here. 
why don't you, well, I mean, you can see the one long ridge that's uh, vertical on the page. Right. Is what's, you know, what you can see from the front. I don't know. I mean, over, -exp over explaining, it makes it sound like it's funny. It's just that they don't, uh, they're not the same length. Let's, you want to look at the model? Yeah, I think that'll be more helpful. Does anyone have any questions about the elevations? Okay, Chad, you should be able to share. The only other question I had about the elevations was um, you, you had indicated the height um, from FFE up, but I didn't have anything marked for the- Okay, okay. Yeah, it's probably, I, I would say it maxes out at four feet, varies like the others, but it probably maxes out about four feet. Okay, so what we're seeing on this height, guys, is probably around 37. Uh, so you can see the double gable here. Let's do this, we'll be able to see it better. Sorry. You can see the double gable on that side and mm -hmm. the ridges just continue all the way across, but one's longer than the other. Yeah, it's super helpful. Very much so, thank you. It's not as complex as it might look on a, a 2D drawing. Exactly. Right. <laughs> it looks weirder than it is. Yeah. And as you can see from any, from substantial street views, they don't really compete with each other when they're not in the same plane. And, and when they are in the same plane, they make kind of a neat composition, so. Right. So, um, you know, just to jump into my comments, um, this is not a roof line that I would recommend on anything other than a tutor, of course. So mm -hmm. um, it makes perfect sense for the architectural inspiration. And uh, I only had questions about the overall height because it wasn't, um, it was the uh, um, the height was marked from FFE up, so I didn't know about the the foundation. So he's trying to cap those at around four feet. Um, this is going down lower, and so we might see some changes as you get further cl um, to closer to the river. But um, but right now this one is um, it's not going to have as high of a foundation as the ones that you've already seen. That's that right. Card? We're going down little little by little as we go left and right from the first submittals. You know, having the um, the porch done that way is is super you know indicative of that architectural style. And um, I was a little concerned on the elevation set about how the um, this um, left elevation might feel without the you know a lot of fenestration on that. But mm -hmm. I, I do think that it's you know it's placed meaningfully, and um, I I can support it. Um, the lot coverage, if it's over thirty five, is the only thing that staff can support on this proposal. Thank you. Okay, Susan Besser. Um, can we have like a straight on view so I can see? Because I think that what I heard Amanda say is that the the roof lines aren't typical of a tutor. Is that what I'm hearing? What you would typically see on a tutor? I feel that this is typical of some tutors. Now we don't have any tutors in downtown that have the double gables on both sides, but I, I think that what he's done is, in my opinion, is typical of a tutor. I'm sorry if I didn't explain that well. Yeah, I guess I, um, I don't know. There's something that's just not coming across quite right on this elevation. So, and I, and, and I think it has to do with the roof lines and, and, and I don't know, just something that's just not um, true to form for a tutor for me. And, uh, and the other thing, you say the height was 37 feet? I think that it's, it's no more than 37 based on what Chad told me. Um, I think we were at 33 something and then um, approximately four foot for a foundation. He's going to pull that okay. up for us to check. And how did this compare with the other houses height-wise? This will be uh, shorter than the highest one and um, okay. probably falling in line. Um, it's not the shortest, but it's definitely um, on that lower end of what we've seen already. Is All that right. fair to say, Chad? Yes. We, we had, we've had some that were, there, we had some that were right at the 39. Yeah. Um, right. So yeah, it's 33, 
to the from the FFE to the highest point of the roof, and then I'm going to say we're probably we get as high as four feet from the grade to the FFE. So that would make it 37, and and I'm and I may be overestimating the FFE to grade on this one. So I'm I'm pretty confident we're going to be 37 or less. Uh, no further questions. Thank you, Chad. Welcome. Thank you. I'm curious, Susan. Though um, I want to make sure that you know I don't misrepresent the Tudor style. Um, is what you're seeing on the front elevation is that what has um, causes concern for you, or is it more of the sides? Uh, I think it's the front, and and I don't. Um, I, I lived in a Tudor house, mm -hmm. so I have a pretty strong Tudor sense. But um, I think the problem, and if, it's, if I'm reading it right, is, is this roof like meet that roof and then this goes up? Is that, am, I, am I reading that right, Chad? Yeah, maybe this angle will help. So the, the main, the larger gable, the dominant gable is pulled forward. I think it's five, maybe six feet. That'd be six feet because it's the depth of the porch. Okay. So okay, this smaller so gable that's there over the, the little window in the bedroom back here is, is much further back. Okay, that's helpful because what I read was that it was all on the same plane. And so right, I, that's yeah. why I wanted to ask because it's like maybe I'm thinking of it wrong too, but no, it's recessed yeah. back. And I went back and I've just looked at some tutors on in, that are historic ones on our street. And they're very emulative of having the main gable and then that either a, um, another gable form or um, a, a dormer sitting back recessed, so. Right. So I guess I still, and I'm still struggling with it a little bit. And I wonder if it wouldn't be better if it were a, a dormer as opposed to another roof line. So there you go. Yeah, I think that's what we see mostly in, in, in Franklin is that it is a, a, a main gable with maybe a secondary gable that houses the door like the front door and then um, the, the, the dormer yeah. on the rest of the roof. You know, uh, that. Um, yeah, I think you would, you see, what you see mostly in Franklin is this, right? Like number three? Oh, I'm sorry, I'm, I moved. <laughs> I, I, I was like, we don't see any of these. <laughs> no, <laughs> none of that. Uh, there we go. We see this. Right, right. Uh, and well, then maybe, maybe, with dorm, maybe, maybe with a dormer there. Here, right? mm -hmm. But I don't want to do that two doors down, so. Right, right. We, we got to do it. We got to get a different flavor on the tutor, which I think the tutor is pretty forgiving in terms of all the flavors it can offer. Um, right. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, well, I think, I think this season's point, like, there's usually like um, a gable over the entry, but this is like a, a recessed entry. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah. I, think well, I appreciate you looking at that and showing that, you know, in comparison <laughs> to what's around it, we want to try to make sure they all look different. So thank you for that. Hey, Lisa. Okay, uh, just quickly, <clears throat> the the I guess you could call it the, uh, the variation of a typical tutor. I think in this case is uh, something that does uh, fit in with the rest of the development, and uh, it's it's nicely done. The, the left wall, the massing on the left wall, if there's a way to break that up a little bit, um, that would be my only comment on uh, the left wall this side. Yes. Sorry, the as you're facing the front on the, the, the left, left. I know, the left, left and right, I'm no the good, left. sorry. <laughs> yeah, that one, uh-huh. Mm. Yeah, that, that might, might look a little bit massive uh, without some kind of, uh, something some detailing perhaps to break it up but uh that's that's my only opinion i don't feel very strongly about that but uh it's just my input thank you thank you okay mary pierce let me i unmuted um <laughs> i this house bothered me some so i spent some time looking and i would like to see the timbers on the front of the house simplified. I feel like that it almost gets to kind of, are you at a Bavarian village, uh, the top <laughs> portion of it, and some simplification 
there with the timbers. Okay. I like that comment, Mary. Um, Chad had had those um, more Englishy style tutors up, you know, the ones that are a little more uh, stylized than what we see in Franklin. And I think that, um, to your point, um, what we see in Franklin's a little bit more stripped down. Yes, and and I think the last thing we want in this um, beautiful environment is to look up and think you might be at the Bavarian village. <laughs> Just on this one little area. We'll you know, know where to go to get good beer. We'll go to this And house. you can't get beer or pretzels. <laughs> <laughs> Just right up in here. Okay. And maybe a little bit there. Up in here? Is this where you're pointing? Yes, sir. What about the little curved and timbers? And maybe those two. Um, I, I you're just stealing looked, my joy, Mary. No, I get it. Well, <laughs> I, I looked at the infill. I looked at a bunch of them, and mm. I do think the ones that are simplified, um, they, they, I just prefer them. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Ken Scalf. I think it's a very handsome design. <clears throat> I just kind of wonder what you're going to do with all the water it comes off between those two gables on the side. Oh, uh, you got to have a big old, <laughs> big old scupper right there, <laughs> for sure. Yeah. Yeah, we got to have a little rain catcher over there. Mr. Chair, a little. This is one where a little bit of extra love on the gutters could really make it. Mm -hmm. I found out something fun when we were designing some houses in Berry Farms, and I really want a gutter manufacturer, a gutter, a gutter guy to show up with his truck because for some silly reason, a half round gutter costs seven times more than an OG gutter. How ridiculous is that? You probably know this all too well, but yeah. how much nicer would that be? You know, it doesn't take much. I know because a good half round copper gutter would look oh amazing gosh. on this house. <laughs> okay, Kathy Worthington. Um, again, I think it looks really handsome, Chad. Um, I do like the Tudor flavor. I do love the little typified arches on, on either side. I'd, I'd, I'd go for Tudor vanilla versus Tudor Neapolitan, maybe. Okay. <laughs> But um, I think I think it, it complements it. Thank you. Thanks. I'm, I'm with Mary on the timber look. Uh, okay. I think it'd be reduced. So I, I, I would, that's my only comment. I think it looks fine, though. And I really appreciate the 3D. Um, well, I'm happy to be able to write. It, it makes so much difference for us. I think it's a great communication tool for sure. It, no question. I hope this is helpful for your, your buyers too. Yeah, well, we've flipped them right into renderings. Some of these are showing up on our website. So it, uh, I'd love to say it was just for you guys, but it, you know, it's only <laughs> mainly for you guys. <laughs> it's 75% for us. That's right. You. That's right. Okay. Well, uh, we certainly do appreciate it. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. That, that ends our uh, agenda. Amanda, do you have any parting words? I just wanted to let you guys know, and I'm going to close screen. Oh, Kelly did for me. Thank you. Or Chad did. Thanks. Okay. So the, um, the city would like to look at setting up a, a special site visit for Harlandsdale Farm, if you're so inclined. Um, we're looking at that for some time in May. Um, I know that if we wait much later than that, it kind of gets into vacation season and, and the hot season, and it's a little bit more difficult out on the open farm. So uh, we'd like to talk about um, the following things. We'd like to talk about our plans for the main barn at Harlandsdale, uh, the bridge that is going to go from Harlandsdale across the river, and then also um, the Friends of Franklin Parks are working, um, is working on a plan for the Hayes House. And so we'd love to talk about all of that with you. I have not set a date. Um, that's something I wanted, the reason I'm bringing this up is because if there are any dates in May that don't work for you, could you please go ahead and kind of look at your calendars and send me uh, your blackout dates? Because I'd like to go ahead and try to coordinate with Friends of Franklin Parks, the Parks Department team um, and yourselves to get something on the books for that. Um, it would mean a lot to us, and I do think it would be more meaningful for you to be able to see these um, 
the proposal um, while on the site so you can get a better sense spatially of how it would all work together. Amanda, how much time are you looking at for the commissioners? I would suggest that it would probably need, because we're adding the Hayes House to maybe two hours at a very maximum. I'm hoping we can get through it in an hour and a half. Okay. And um, I see Ken has already sent me yep. his, his time. So that's, I appreciate that, thanks. Okay, anything else from anybody before we, if not, I need a motion to adjourn. Uh, I didn't want to also mention, speaking of all the meetings, I'm asking you guys to do a special in addition to your other ones, and I really appreciate that. We do have a special DRC meeting set up for next week at 4.30. Um, I'll be working on a presentation for that, um, getting that to, to you really soon. We'll talk about infill buildings. So that's going to be um, new, um, new houses, probably primarily um, new garages and then also new commercial buildings. What we would talk about like height, massing scale, setbacks, uh, expectations for the new design guidelines. So that uh, is next Mr. Tuesday. Chair, can I just say one thing real quick? Yeah, wait uh, a minute. Let me, go, let me go back to okay. uh, Amanda. What was the date on that again? That is on April 27th? the 26th at 4.30 p.m. That's and Monday. I'll, Did you yes, that's and I'll send you a Zoom invite on that. Okay. Um, and I think okay. Kelly had an um, announcement she wanted to make too. I do. And I'm going to look for the date real quick. This is an exciting. And, but I really, yeah, I really was going to say, I just wanted to thank you so much for all of your hours dedicated and donated to making the historic district a better place and to preserve it and to protect it. I, can't thank you enough. I know this is really long. So um, we do have a special meeting May 24th for City Hall and also possibly a smaller topic for the design guidelines update. And uh, after that, we will stop giving you special meetings for a while. <laughs> you can have a great summer. <laughs> We really appreciate your extra time that you have spent. They're really important <laughs> endeavors and initiatives for us, but, and then we're going to give you the summer off. <laughs> you know, as an update to you guys, we've been working a lot behind the scenes on the new city hall um, plan with the consultants. We've also worked really hard on the design guidelines update. So I am working on um, putting, um, putting together a, a, a big picture question survey to put out to the public. And we'll, we should have that out by the end of this month and we'll push it as part of our preservation month endeavor for May. Um, but we're really excited about that. I've got a draft, a very rough draft, but a draft prepared and, and hopefully, you know, based on the continued meetings that we have with you guys, I'll be able to, to start speaking to you and showing you some of the language we put together. So. Um, I couldn't do this without Kelly, but I, um, I'm very proud if this is something that we've wanted for a long time and um, we're going to have a better document for you guys to use to be able to help folks. And I hope it's something more intuitive for it, even the user to use. So um, the folks who are on these meetings with us will be able to pick up that document and really understand it a lot better um, before they enter these meetings. Thank you. Mary Pierce. I just wanted to... Um... I think you all probably know, but the African American Heritage Society has uh, the Merrill Williams House under contract and we have a year to raise the money. Yeah. So we're excited. Uh, and if you get a chance, drive by the house, the mm -hmm. Macklemore house you helped us with. Um, the exterior is rounding the corner. It is, it looks great. Mm -hmm. So the Merrill House, uh, Merrill Williams House is at the corner of uh, 11th and Natchez, mm -hmm. if you want to drive by there. It's an extraordinarily, you know, precious historic mm -hmm. and architectural resource. And the Macklemore House, I drive by pretty often and, and it's come a long way. It looks fantastic, Mary. Thank you. Okay, if nothing else, I need a motion to adjourn. So moved, this is Ken. Thank you, Ken. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Mary. All right. Susan Besser. Aye. Uh, Lisa Marquardt. Oh, she's gone. Uh, Mary Pierce. Aye. Ken Scalf. Aye. Kathy Worthington. Aye. And Jim Roberts. Aye. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Bye, guys.